The Royal Commission is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning. This is the beginning of the first substantive hearing of the Royal Commission into National Natural Disaster Arrangements. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, their connections to land, sea and community, and to all elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people watching today. I also acknowledge and welcome my fellow commissioners, the Honourable Dr Annabel Bennett and Professor Andrew McIntosh, who join me here today. At the outset, we reaffirm our recognition of the profound impact that natural disasters, in particular the 2019-2020 bushfire season, have had on our nation. While it is necessary to address the current worldwide COVID-19 pandemic, we have not forgotten the devastation of the bushfires or the ongoing effects experienced by those in disaster-affected communities across the country. We have visited many of these communities and appreciate the challenges they are still facing. We know many of those communities across Australia are also still grieving. The tragic loss of life, the destruction of homes, the significant loss of livestock and millions of hectares of forest has been devastating and continues to deeply affect people and their recovery. In many cases, the ongoing effects of the bushfire season are being further compounded by the measures necessary to address the COVID-19 pandemic. On behalf of the Commission, I extend my deepest sympathy to those who have lost loved ones, who have suffered injuries, suffered injuries or loss. We also acknowledge those who continue to suffer. We encourage anyone listening today who needs support through this time to contact Lifeline Australia's dedicated support service and further details on support available can be found on our website. Commissioners I and I are acutely aware of the inevitability of the next bushfire season and those to come. To that end we have moved swiftly to conduct our inquiry as expeditiously as possible. During our community forums in fire affected communities earlier this year Many people recounted their experiences of the recent bushfires. Those stories are a part of our history and deserve a place amongst the stories of our time. This is why we recently launched our 2019-2020 bushfire history project, inviting people to share their videos or photographs taken during the bushfires or of the ongoing recovery. People can also submit a short video account of what they experienced during the bushfires. This collection of videos and photographs will be catalogued to allow future generations to understand the impact that the 2019-2020 bushfires had on our nation and our people. Further information on this important historical project can be found on our website. As I mentioned earlier, today marks the beginning of our substantive hearings. To comply with the national COVID-19 health measures, our public hearings will be conducted electronically with proceedings live streamed via our website. Members of the public would normally be welcome and indeed invited to attend Royal Commission hearings in person. However, that is not possible. Our hearings will have only essential personnel in the hearing room with all witnesses appearing by video link or giving their evidence by pre-prepared videos. Likewise, the public health measures have had an impact on those who we, who we have been engaging with the Commission. We acknowledge the pressures that the current health crisis has placed on a number of entities engaging with us and we've been pleased to be flexible to enable engagement with this inquiry alongside that critical response. We thank the many individuals and we thank the organisations who have assisted the communication, sorry, the Commission in its work to date. Commissioners, I recognise that each of us brings with us a diverse professional background and experiences that assist us in conducting our inquiry. This includes knowledge of different government entities and involvement with different experts and organisations in both a professional and personal capacity, or both. Commissioners have agreed that in any situation which may give rise to an actual or perceived conflict of interest, commissioners will openly identify the particulars of that possible conflict to one another 
to our official secretary and counsel assisting the commission, where appropriate, take further mitigatory action. There have been a number of parties that have been granted leave to appear, and the terms on which that leave has been granted have been communicated to them. The parties granted leave will be published on our website. Due to the technical complexities involved in the use of video conference, conferencing facilities, I will not ask each party's representatives to formally announce their appearance. And with that, thank you, Ms Hogan Doran. Commissioners, time is short and so I will make only brief remarks before calling the first of today's witnesses on the changing global climate and natural disaster risk. Much has happened in the five weeks that have passed since our ceremonial hearing on April 16. The ongoing impact of the global coronavirus pandemic has been profound. As the evidence will show, the recovery from the devastating impacts of the 2019-2020 bushfire season has been slowed and fragmented. Planning for future seasons appears to have been interrupted. As for the logistical challenges for the Commission in preparing substantive hearings during a global pandemic, the constraints have been daunting. I acknowledge and give my personal thanks to the many people who have assisted this Royal Commission during this difficult time. Commission staff, solicitors and counsel have worked tirelessly, oftentimes in isolation at home or in Canberra, far away from young families and elderly relatives, to ready the matters for hearing. When I addressed you in April, the Royal Commission had received about 400 submissions. That number quickly grew to some 1,700 submissions. In addition to preparing this fortnight's public hearings, several background papers and the first of several issues papers have been prepared and published. Video consultations have commenced with various stakeholders and many more are planned for coming weeks. In these hearings over the next two weeks, up to 50 witnesses will assist the Royal Commission. Each has been issued either a compulsory notice to give a statement of information to themselves or to their organisation, and each will attend under summons. While this hearing block will largely involve evidence from Commonwealth government agencies and industry representatives, the Commission will also hear evidence from members of the communities affected by bushfires. This evidence should serve to reinforce the importance of the Commission's work. Our approach to the evidence will be layered rather than sequential. As we look to set the scene for the Royal Commission's work, we will continue to search for evidence and insights as material continues to come to hand. As at 22 May, last Friday, 73 notices to produce had been answered. Responses to 159 notices to give information had been received with some 16,589 documents being produced, totalling some 242,530 pages. In light of the coronavirus pandemic and the public health restrictions, most state and territory governments requested and were granted substantial extensions to produce documents and provide information to the Royal Commission. Some notices have only been answered in recent days and others remain due to be responded to. The delay in the production schedule has influenced our choice and sequencing of topics for public hearings. We expect that with the ongoing cooperation, this will ensure that the important work of this Royal Commission can be accomplished. And to today. The letters patent and the terms of reference acknowledge the changing global climate and the challenge this poses to Australia's ability to prevent, mitigate and respond to bushfires and other natural disasters. This morning, you will hear evidence, Commissioners, from three national science agencies of the Commonwealth of Australia, the Bureau of Meteorology, the CSIRO and Geoscience Australia. Their evidence today will explore the changing climate in Australia and natural hazards. Further witnesses from the Bureau of Meteorology, the CSIRO and Geoscience will return to give evidence during the course of the Commission's inquiry. And to the first two witnesses. Commissioners, the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO play an important role in monitoring, analysing and communicating observed and future changes in Australia's climate. Collaboratively, these two agencies contribute to research that underpins the health, security and prosperity of Australians in areas such as weather and ocean prediction, 
hazard prediction and warnings, climate variability and climate change, water supply and management, and adaptation to climate impacts. Every two years, the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO publish a report on the state of the climate. The last report was published in 2018. A new report is currently being prepared. Geoscience Australia is the national public sector geoscience organisation. It is the preeminent source of information on Australia's geology and geography for government, industry and community decision making. Its work covers the Australian landmass, marine jurisdiction and territories in Antarctica. Geoscience Australia's work aligns with the Commonwealth Government's science and research priorities and supports global and domestic initiatives. One key area of work is supporting Australia's community safety to strengthen Australia's resilience to the impact of hazards. Commissioners, there is a large bundle of material that has been prepared for each of these witnesses. Each of the witnesses this morning will address you and provide their evidence by way of a presentation, which will be accompanied by a PowerPoint presentation, which will include animations. If it is convenient, I will now call Dr. Carl Braganza of the, of the Bureau of Meteorology. Please call Dr. Braganza. Good morning. Dr. Braganza, good morning. Good morning, good morning to you. Dr. Braganza, do you solemnly and sincere, sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence that you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Dr. Braganza, have you prepared a curriculum vitae for the Commission and provided it to, to, for our purposes? I have. And a PowerPoint presentation, the influence of climate variability and change on the 2019-2020 Australian bushfire season? That's correct. And have you also provided four additional documents which are publications of the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub. I have. And those are bushfires and climate change in Australia, east coast lows and climate change in Australia, thunderstorms and climate change in Australia, and tropical cyclones and climate change in Australia. That's correct. If it's convenient, Commission, as I propose that those documents be identified and tendered, I will read onto the transcript the document codes and the proposed exhibit numbers for those documents. So those documents will be received as an exhibit as marked and as you read. Thank you. The first is Dr Braganza's curriculum vitae, which is BOM.502.001.0078. Which is proposed exhibit 1.1.7. The next is exhibit 1.1.1, which is the PowerPoint presentation, which is exhibit ID BOM.502.001.0001, the next exhibit 1.1.2, Earth Systems and Climate Change. Hub's publication, Bushfires and Climate Change in Australia, is BOM.503.001.0001. The next exhibit 1.1.3, Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub publication, East Coast Lows and Climate Change in Australia, is exhibit number BOM.503.001.0005. The next exhibit 1.1.4, Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub publication, Thunderstorms and Climate Change in Australia, document ID BOM.503.001.0009. And finally, no, I withdraw that. Penultimately, exhibit 1.1.5, 
Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub publication, Tropical Cyclones and Climate Change in Australia, ID BOM.503.001.0013, and finally, Exhibit 1.1.6, the Joint Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO report, State of the Climate 2018, ID BOM.503.001.0017. That's the material concerning Dr. Braganza. Dr. Braganza, the PowerPoint presentation. Just excuse me for one moment, Dr. Braganza, while I am further amplified. That's while that's being done, if the PowerPoint presentation can be readied, it's convenient. As I understand it, Dr. Braganza, you will be um, indicating when uh, to the operator when to move forward through the presentation. The commissioners may have questions during the course of your, your, your presentation, but otherwise I'll be inviting the commissioners to ask any questions at the end. Right. Understood. When you're ready, Dr. Braganza. Sure. So today we're going to talk about the influence of climate variability and change on the 2019-2020 Australian bushfire season. We're looking at the influence of long-term climate trends, um, its interplay with natural variability, um, and what that means for extreme events. So that's the kinds of the types of natural hazards um, that influence natural disasters. Um, so that's the overarching theme of the talk. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So this is a high resolution satellite loop um, of the fires that occurred on the south coast of New South Wales and East Gippsland towards the end of 2019. Um, to examine those long term trends and natural variability, we're going to look at the events leading in to these events. So what we call antecedent conditions, which is really the preceding two years um, of climate variability um, and, tra and change um, influencing these events. We go to the next slide, please. So we'll start with talking about Australia's natural climate drivers. So what were they doing in the lead up to the summer of 2019, 2020? We can go to the next slide, please. So this is a graph of Australian rainfall variability. The blue lines here are where the Australian continent has experienced rainfall above the average that it received during 1961 to 1990, and the red lines where we've received rainfall below that average. As you can see, there's a great deal of continental variability. So Australia is quite unique um, for a continent in that large swathes of the country move from very wet to very dry conditions periodically. Um, not many continents experience that kind of cohesive variability um, or coherent variability across large um, spatial scales. Um, normally you'd have one area wet and one area dry, for example, but Australia is an island in the middle of these two tropical Pacific Oceans in the Indian and Pacific, and that's what drives this rainfall variability. So drought, including severe and protracted drought, is a natural part of the Australian climate system, and wet conditions, and including very wet conditions, are also a natural part of our climate. These changes also influence extreme events, so um, the frequency and severity of heat waves and drought, tropical cyclones and heavy rainfall are influenced by these decadal shifts in Australia's climate. If we can go to the next slide, please. So why does Australia experience such large year-to-year -year and decade-to-decade -decade variability? It's largely to do with the movement of warm and cold water in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. So over timescales of months to years, we have movements, very large movements of warm water in this instance in the tropical Pacific Ocean. What we're looking at here is the development of something called an El Nino event. That's where the warm waters in the tropical Pacific move to the east of the basin and you can see this classic warm tongue um, that defines an El Nino event. The same thing happens in the Indian Ocean and this massive movement of warm water is, is significant enough to affect global climate and to exert the largest influence on Australian climate variability from one year to the next and from one decade to the next. we we'll go to the next slide, please. 
So I'm just going to quickly explain how these um, oscillatory modes, so these oscillations in, in the global climate system work. Um, it's important to understand um, how these work to understand the influences on the 2019-2020 fire, uh, fire season. Um, it's important also to understand that there's some predictability in these events. So um, operationally, when we're looking um, at the horizon leading into summer, um, we often get months' notice um, of the types of conditions we're going to see. So there's three states that the Pacific Ocean likes to sit in, and this is called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or, or ENSO. Um, the neutral phase, which is the state that it most it sits in most often, um, describes a pattern where the trade winds blow from east to west across the Pacific, um, they pull warm water to the north of Australia, and we generally get atmospheric moisture following that warm water. So it rains typically, um, climatologically on average, um, to the north of Australia um, in, these neutral, in this neutral phase. Um, a La Nina basically describes an intensification of this pattern. So the trade winds blow more strongly, um, we have warmer water to the north of Australia and an intensification of that rainfall pattern, um, often dragging rainfall down across the entire Australian continent. During an El Nino event, it's the opposite of that. So we have a reversal of the trade winds. We actually shift the warm water to the eastern Pacific. Um, the atmospheric moisture tends to follow that warm water and we get wet conditions um, in South America and southern North America and dry conditions over, over Australia. In 2019, we had a neutral phase of ENSO, so we didn't get much help um, for either dry or wet conditions from El Nino or La Nina. We can go to the next slide, please. There is a cohort of ENSO in the Indian Ocean, and it's called the Indian Ocean Dipole. So similarly, during a neutral phase, um, the, the, the predominant pattern is for rainfall over the Indonesian region, and during what's called a negative phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole, that pattern intensifies, and we have warmer water to the northwest of Australia, which typically results in more rainfall over parts of the country, particularly the southeast. A positive Indian Ocean Dipole is where that pattern reverses, and the warm water tends to shift to the coast of East Africa, and it takes the rainfall with it. And we often experience drier conditions in Australia associated with what's known as a positive IOD. From May to December in 2019, we were under the influence of a positive IOD. So this was favouring drier than average conditions over much of Australia and certainly the southeast. If we can go to the next slide, please. A third climate influence that's very important is what's called the southern annular mode. So this describes the belt of westerlies that circumnavigate the Antarctic continent. Um, these can either push up further north or they can contract further south to around Antarctica. Um, a positive phase of the southern annular mode typically sees the storm tracks, so those um, coal fronts that bring rainfall to the south of Australia shift further south, and we can get drier conditions over southern Australia. We can also get slightly wetter conditions into eastern Australia. During a negative southern annular mode, um, those, those westerlies push further north, and that's what we saw over October to December. Um, that pattern was associated with a typical summer response of a negative SAM in Australia, and what that means is drier conditions over eastern Australia and stronger westerly winds, or more predominant westerly winds, which can assist um, fire weather um, into southern Queensland and, North, and New South Wales. Um, we also had something in weather and climate circles known as a southern stratospheric warming event. Um, the important thing to understand about that is that the southern annual mode is generally a shorter-lived event than the IOD and ENSO, um, but it was sustained by this southern stratospheric warming event. So it acted on the Australian climate um, for some months in spring and early summer. So we had two influences in a positive IOD and a negative SAM that were favouring drier and warmer conditions over southeastern Australia. We can go to the next slide, please. So we're now going to switch to look at long-term trends. So they're the climate drivers. Um, obviously, climate is changing, so the, global, the globe is warming, and Australia's climate is responding to that. We can go to the next slide. So there's trends in a range of climate indicators, um, most, um, most uh, solidly in temperature. So Australia has warmed by... 1.4 degrees, um, mostly since the middle of last century. That trend is going on in the background. What we've got here is a list of things that are now 
um, impacted by that trend. So these are changes that are impactful, um, they're phenomena, and they're ones that are emerging from that background of nat natural climate variability. So natural climate variability is large in Australia. Um, for us to notice the trends, they have to rise above that background noise. And we can see that now in the increased frequency of large scale heat waves and record high temperatures um, in a longer fire season with more extreme fire danger days and in prolonged high ocean temperatures. So we also have marine heat waves that impact on our ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we have reduced average rainfall in the cool season, which we will also focus on talking about here. Events that are starting to be apparent, so we have trends globally in heavy rainfall and obviously trends for increased sea level. Um, these trends are starting to emerge from that background of natural climate variability. And in Australia, heavy rainfall has a very large um, natural um, variability. So we would expect that trend um, to continue into the future and to become apparent as time goes by. Next slide, please. So if we can summarise the various influences leading into that 2019-2020 fire season in the next slide. So we had a positive Indian Ocean dipole, um, which made itself felt from May to December, but most acutely over that spring period and, and, and December, um, affecting South East Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. Next. We had a negative southern annular mode, so increased likelihood of above average temperatures and below average rainfall in spring and summer across large parts of New South Wales, southern Queensland, and an increased spring and early summer fire risk in, in, in New South Wales and southern Queensland as well. Next. We had not much help from um, ENSO, so we had neutral conditions in the Pacific. And on the next slide, And we also have trends going on in the background. So material to the events of the summer, we had an increased likelihood of warmer than average temperatures because of the background trend, an increased likelihood of reduced cool season rainfall, and an increased likelihood of a longer fire season and higher fire danger. So when we talk about these events, um, how they reinforce each other, we have trends going on that were reinforced by two drivers in positive IOD and the southern annular mode. As we'll see over the course of this presentation, that means that we're not just favouring warmer and drier conditions, we're actually pushing up into events that start to become um, more often unprecedented or beyond the historical record. Next slide. So we're going to go um, variable by variable here. I'm going to talk about temperature first, then rainfall, and then I'll talk about fire weather, which collects quite a few meteorological variables together. Next slide. So I'll start these um, variable variable breakdowns with the trend first. Um, Australia is warm by about 1.4, 1.5 degrees um, over the last 100 years. This is a graph looking at extreme national heat days. So in Australia, we can calculate the temperature of the entire continent daily um, as the average of all of our weather stations across the continent. Then we can place that into percentiles. So what we're looking at here is the number of times the national daily temperature reached the 99th percentile, so the top 1% of warmest days historically. If you look at the early half of this record, you can see the natural variability that I've talked about. So some years we have spikes. Each decade we would have a spike in the number of national daily temperatures reaching the 99th percentiles. percentiles. Some years we didn't have any, any such um, days um, and that natural variability is largely driven by the modes of variability that I discussed earlier. We can also see a very significant trend now. So the number of such days has greatly increased. The number of years without any um, such days has now gone. And we have the spike days that are much uh, more extreme than in the past. So in 2013, which was Australia's warmest year on record at the time, we had 27 such days. And in 2019, we had 43 such days. It took several decades to accumulate um, just what we saw in 2013, for example. So that makes a big difference to Australia's environment and ecology and to the operational and built systems to manage these events. If they occur once every decade or once every few years, it's quite different to them occurring every year or several times per year. We can go to the next slide, please. So just some examples of record-breaking heat waves, and I've chosen these two examples 
um, and we'll come back to them when we talk about projections. So one is iconically the Black Saturday heat wave and day of, of um, severe fire weather across southeastern Australia. Um, this was a notable event for the duration of heat um, with individual site records. So what does that mean? Individual sites broke their all-time records. We had temperatures pushing up into the high 40s in South Australia and Victoria. Um, we had a very long heat wave. So Melbourne, for example, had three days above 43 in the week before Black Saturday. That heat wave was associated with about 500 excess deaths across South Australia and Victoria. And of course, Black Saturday itself, the bushfires claimed 173 lives. Um, it challenged our health systems. It also challenges things like our energy system in making sure that we can keep lights on into all jurisdictions. Um, we had help from natural variability for this event in that we were at the end of a very prolonged drought and that tends to assist um, high temperatures across the Australian continent. In January 2013, we saw a heat wave that was unprecedented. So we broke every sequential national record from one day through to one month in, in early January. Um, this heat wave was notable for the duration. So we didn't set as many, um, set as many site records, but the national daily temperature set many site records. Um, incidentally, this event was broken um, both in December in terms of national daily temperatures and in terms of um, January um, temperatures themselves in January 2019. Um, this is a multi-jurisdictional event. So when we talk about the change in the frequency of events, it's these events that are really challenging. Um, we have to allocate resources over a number of states. There was fires in New South Wales and Tasmania associated with this event, for example. We can go, and we'll come back to these two events later. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the maps I'm going to show you are the historical record for rainfall and temperature and fire weather placed into percentiles. So what does that mean? If we look at a particular event, we can tell you where in the historical distribution it sits. So for this talk, I'm going to be focusing mostly on for temperature, um, events that occurred in the top 10% of warm, um, warm periods or highest on record. And for rainfall, we'll concentrate on those that occur in the lowest 10% of records or lowest on records. So heat and drought is what we'll be focusing on. If we can go to the next slide. So using that decile map, um, another way to look at the trend over Australia is to look at temperatures this century. So the 20 year period starting in 2000 has been the highest on record compared to all other 20 year periods. So it's the duration of heat that I'm drawing attention to here. You can see over most of the country, we have temperatures that are highest on record, very much above average or above average. But for where all the population centres sit, um, certainly we've seen a very long period, protracted period of temperatures that are the warmest on record. We can go to the next slide. So the left graph there is showing the rise in Australian temperature anomalies, so departures from average. And you can see the trend that I've referred to, Australia warming by about 1.4, 1.5 degrees. On the right, I've got December maximum temperature. So that's a daytime temperature. You can see there's a trend in December temperatures, but you can see what happened in 2019. We have this outlier that is well above the trend. So this is where we start to look at the influence of both the trend and natural variability. So you can see outliers for December temperatures in the past. Um, you can see the spikes that rise well above that trend. As we push that trend further, it increases the chances that we'll see events, extreme events, that are beyond our historical experience. So rather than just being warmer than average due to an El Nino or a positive IOD, the trend means we're increasingly likely to see temperatures that are highest on record. We can go to the next slide, please. And if we look at December map, so if we map that outlier, you can see just over that month, um, we had temperatures over most of the country that was either in the 90th percentile or highest on record. And that's the background setting for the fires that we saw around the country in that month. But I'll also talk about the fires that occurred earlier in spring as well. And if we go to the next slide. So I'm now gonna switch from temperature to rainfall. Next slide. And I'm going to start with those long-term changes. So we're focusing on the cool season here, which is where the most significant changes in Australian rainfall has occurred statistically. So what we've had over those cooler months of the year, April to September, is um, 
a higher pressure in the Australian region. So there's a trend towards um, higher atmospheric pressure. Um, that typically means a reduced chance of rainfall from the sort of cold fronts and cut-off lows that bring rainfall to the southern parts of the continent. Most um, most importantly, southwest of WA um, and the southeast of the continent. So in reducing the chance of that rainfall, you would expect to see rain, rainfall um, during those months that is less than in the past. And if you look over um, the, the 20th century, so again, analogously to the map I showed for temperature, over, 20, 000, over, over the period 2000 to 2019, we see lowest on record rainfall over large parts of Australia that correlate with that trend in, in, in pressure. So this means that we have reduced chances of getting rainfall during that time of the year. In parts of New South Wales, we've offset that with some increases in summer rainfall. Importantly here, though, we're looking at the influence of what happens when you remove that cool season rainfall and then what happens if the summer rainfall doesn't arrive. Summer rainfall is quite variable. Um, it wouldn't arrive typically during a drought period, for example. So this is um, essentially, as with the temperature, loading the dice in favour of drier conditions. We can go to the next slide. So we're now going to look over the drought period. So we've looked at the trends in the background. We're now going to look at the natural event, which is drought and severe drought in Australia. Um, it's instructive to look at how the rainfall anomalies progressed since January 2018. So the yellows and reds here are where we've got rainfall deficiencies, and that's rainfall that's below average. And if we can progress the next slide, we should see how these rainfall um, anomalies unfold. So starting in January, you can see over several months, the oranges and reds starting to spread. Um, you can see along the east coast, we're now getting rainfall deficiencies that are um, in excess of 600 millimetres less than what you'd normally expect. And if you look closely at those regions, you'll see that they are um, corresponding to areas that saw significant bushfire activity. So southern Queensland, northern New South Wales, the east coast of New South Wales, into Victoria and parts of South Australia and Tasmania. Going to the next slide. So the influence of both background trends, warming trends and periodic drought can be seen on this map. So this is a drought map for the past 21 months. Um, what's notable here are the, are, are the regions of lowest on record rainfall. So it's not just a severe drought. Um, there's large regions and many um, observing stations that saw rainfall that was very much below their previous historical records. And again, that's that interplay of background trends um, and natural variability. We can go to the next slide, please. So I'm now going to try and gather together rainfall and temperature um, to look at these things in a coincident way. Um, when extremes line up in multiple variables, that's when you can actually amplify the kind of extremes that lead to um, uh, natural disasters and natural hazards as well. So going to the next slide. Fire weather is a phenomenon that collects together multiple climate variables. So um, there's no clear definition for a compound event, but in meteorology and climatology, we're really talking about events where we have coincident extremes in multiple variables at the same time. And this can be of different timescales for a drought intersecting with a heat wave, or it can be within a meteorological event itself, such as a fire weather day. So fire weather is a good example of that, and it's a good example of a phenomenon that's influenced by antecedent conditions, so those leading into the event, as well as the um, events of the day itself. If we can progress to the next slide. I'm going to be talking about uh, the MacArthur Forest Fire Danger Index a lot, or FFDI. So this is a measure for ass assessing the severity of fire weather. Um, it's a tool that is very commonly used in Australia. It collects temperature, um, wind speed, relative humidity, um, and a drought factor. The influences that are very important to fire ignition and the ability of fires to spread in a way that's difficult to control in Australia. There are other fire danger indices, but for climatological purposes, this is the one for which um, we have very good observations going back to 1950, so we could construct this index. And it also is shown to well describe fire weather, particularly over forested regions in Australia, for scientific purposes. The drought factor within the FFDI um, changes around the country, but a common one that is used is the keech byram Drought Index, or KD, KDDI. Um, it's essentially a measure of soil moisture deficit. So if you had a saturated soil, how much less moisture do you have than that? You can go to the next. 
slide. Um, so as discussed, it's um, useful um, in many parts of the world to integrate the meteorological variables and the fuel information into a single measure, and it's useful for monitoring changes over a long period of time, which is what we're doing here. Next slide, please. So droughts in Australia are getting hotter. I've focused here on New South Wales. So the current drought really was centred um, very firmly on New South Wales and then surrounding states. Um, droughts are very different in their characteristics. So um, having a drought index for the whole country is problematic because droughts change in their spatial footprint. So for, here, for this talk, we're just looking at New South Wales. Um, the yellow dots there, are, um, so what we've got on the bottom um, axis here is the Keach-Byram Drought Index, K KBDI. So those yellow dots, if they're closer to the vertical axis, it um, was less dry. And if they're going to the right, then it's drier conditions. On the vertical axis, I have um, maximum temperature. So um, if you're down near um, the x-axis here, then you've got cooler temperatures. And as you go up that scale, you've got hotter temperatures. So what you can see here is a clear relationship between rainfall and temperature in Australia. When it's wet, it tends to be cooler, and when it's dry, it tends to be warmer. And that's largely because the soils act a bit like an evaporative cooler. As you evaporate um, moisture from the soils, it tends to cool the surface temperature. So you get this very neat relationship between rainfall and temperature in Australia. What this graph, or what this plot shows, is that we are increasing temperatures independent of rainfall. So the orange, the yellow dots there, um, uh, the scatter of rainfall and temperature or drought factor and temperature from 1911 to 1999, so last century. The yellow, the orange dots are what has occurred from 1999 to 2009. So you can see that those orange dots are all generally above where the yellow dots sit. And that means that temperatures have increased, um, but they've increased independent of temperature. If you look at the red dots as well, they're sitting higher again. So in the last 10 years, 2009 to 2019, we've had the hottest temperatures we've seen. And what that means is we've given a little bit of an extra push to the extreme events. So 2018 and 2019, you can see are both outliers for dryness and heat. So it was Australia-wide, 2019 was our hottest and driest year on record. And certainly for New South Wales, it was for New South Wales, 2018 was not far behind. So we had 24 months of very exceptional um, um, conditions driven by, in part, these background trends and natural variability. I should say there's also a trend in relative humidity, not just in Australia, but in all similar environments around the world. And that, that, in, that increase in, uh, sorry, that decrease in relative humidity is due to the rainfall changes we've discussed, the temperature changes, um, and a range of other factors. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'm going to start looking back, not at the fire season that just was, but given the fact that we had two years or three years of very dry conditions over Australia, um, it's instructive to look at what happened spring 2018. So this is fire activity along about a 600 kilometre stretch off the Queensland coast. And in terms of our operational experience, um, this is another event that was unprecedented. So you can see on this satellite image, um, coincident fires over a very, very large stretch of um, the coast. Going to the next slide. As we got into summer across Victoria and Tasmania, we had extensive fire activity again. So you can see the smoke plumes here um, across Tasmania from the 29th of Jan. Um, it was a long campaign season, so that means we had fires burning um, from spring right through to March in these two southern states. And again, um, prior to the year that just, just was, we were talking about these events as being quite unprecedented and something that we were going to have to um, look at in terms of changing our operational response to in, the, in now and into the future. We can go to the next slide. And this is, of course, the fires that occurred on the south coast and eastern um, Victoria um, at the end of December and start of January. Um, and this is about a 300, 400 um, kilometre stretch. And, of course, there was fires burning to the north of here in New South Wales up to the Queensland border and over um, during spring. So that just sets the context here that this isn't a one-off event that we're looking at here. Um, really, since the Canberra 2003 fires, 
every jurisdiction in Australia has seen this really have seen some really significant fire events that have challenged um, what we do to respond to them, um, and have really challenged what we thought um, fire weather looked like um, pre preceding this period. So the frequency of these events. Um, if we look at the historical record, seems to be increasing. Um, these large fire events, when you look back over the 20th and 19th century, were not as frequent as they were this century. If we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm now going to look at fire weather itself through that index, the FFDI, the Forest Fire Danger Index. So this is a map showing a trend in accumulated FFDIs. So that's where we just add the FFDI every day um, over a year. So what this map is essentially showing is that almost over all, all of Australia, we're seeing a longer fire season with more fire danger days during that season and the severity of the worst fire danger days is becoming more severe. You can see that the largest changes are in some parts of the country where we don't have much fuel. Um, that's no surprise. Um, those parts of the country, um, the ecology is adapted to having more frequent hot and dry conditions. If you go to the next map, This is the fire weather trend expressed as a percentage of the average. So what we're looking at now is the change relative to the typical amount of fire weather that, these lo that every location experiences. And what you can see now, and this is for the season spring, is that you're getting large relative changes in some parts and lots of parts of the country where there is a great deal more forest, fire, uh, forest fuel. Um, Spring has been chosen particularly uh, for, for significance here. So the fire season is extending, but that is probably most significant in spring. We're getting early season heat waves. We're getting the longest extension of fire season into that spring. And it also means that we're having a longer curing season before the summer weather arrives. So thinking back over this talk, the heat waves are influencing spring. The cool season rainfall leading into this period, we're, we're um, waiting, waiting the odds in favour of less rainfall, and then um, we're having fire weather start in spring itself. If we can go to the next slide. So this is an attempt to look at the change in the arrival of the first significant fire danger day. So we've chosen FFDI above 25 to mark the first day of the season. And if you want to read this graph, it's for the south coast of New South Wales, so the rainfall districts. It's the anywhere in that location if we get an FFDI above 25. And you can see in the 1950s, the first day of arrival for this for significant fire weather was at the end of spring, start of summer, so November to December. If you follow that line down, um, at present we're getting the first significant fire danger day arriving um, at the start of spring or end of winter. So that's about three months earlier. That's obviously significant for all the reasons I've just talked about, if, and it's similar for Eastern Victoria. If we go to the next um, slide, and that's just an example of the Bega Valley fire that occurred in August 2018. So this obviously has implications for overlapping fire seasons. So throughout Australia, the fire seasons aren't unified. So Queensland goes a little bit earlier, for example, and ends earlier. Um, Compared to our historical experience then, we have more overlapping fire seasons within Australia and globally as well. So fire seasons in all similar climates around the globe are also extending. If we can go to the next slide. So now we're just going to look at um, a map essentially of fire conditions from the start of spring, so from the start of September 2019. And just to reiterate, we have long-term climate trends, and then over this period we also have prolonged multi-year drought. Then we have a positive IOD event, which is favouring warmer and drier conditions, and a negative SAM event, which is favouring warmer and drier conditions. If we progress the next slide through, we can see these orange areas starting to grow. So you can see the fire danger accumulated across September and October now for northern New South Wales and southern Queensland starting to be highest on record. Next slide. And then you can see again by November those conditions are starting to worsen and you're starting to see highest on record along the south coast and into Tasmania, South Australia and Victoria. In the next slide. And then by December, we had record fire danger for the three, four-month period over most of the country, and if not, in the 90th percentile. Going to the next slide. 
So December was a very extreme example of that. So again, the background trend, this extreme event, a significant outlier, um, record high fire danger across most of the country and leading into the end of that month and the start of January. On the next slide. So just showing on a graph similar to we did for temperature where 2019 um, December actually sat. So I've just chosen, for example, here to look at southern Queensland. On the left, you can see a count of the days above uh, with we had an FFDI above 25 in Queensland. So you can see a trend in spring on the left there. Um, you can see extreme events, so 2002, 2013. Um, but that trend, again, is basically increasing the odds that we'll see um, periods that are unprecedented. And on the right, you can see um, just where December actually sat. So it's, it's a significant outlier, probably driven by the influence of natural variability, but also the trends that have occurred in the months leading up to December. So December itself might not have a strong trend, but when all the things come together, then that's when you expect to see um, the realisation of all those factors in an extreme event such as we saw. Going to the next slide. And now we're looking at the highest fire danger day within December. So individual days within that month reached highest on record at the daily time scale. And you can see here again, it occurred in a lot of um, areas where we had significant fire activity. So Southeast South Australia, um, Eastern Victoria, um, Northeast uh, New South Wales, parts of Tasmania as well. Um, this also shows that there's a lot of regions where we didn't get ignition and we could have. So the Otways, for example, in Victoria, um, could conditions have been worse over summer? Certainly they could have if we had more ignitions in some of these orange zones. And remembering we didn't get much help from El Nino. So if we had an El Nino occurring at the same time, which does happen um, when we have a positive IOD, then we might have seen worse conditions again. Next slide. So this is where my discussion of the antecedent or uh, precursor conditions ends um, in the days leading up to that fire. But before we do that, just to re-emphasise what we've been talking about. So the top two um, um, maps there for the south coast of New South Wales and East Gippsland show the impact of long-term drought. So um, as we saw at the end of the millennium drought with the Black Saturday bushfires, this is a extremely significant precondition for the sorts of fires that we've seen. So we had um, rainfall deficiencies for the, for the three years um, that were lowest on record, particularly for Eastern Victoria, but also significantly um, for New South Wales, as we've discussed. And then just that period, July to December, um, we saw an intense period of, of, of no rainfall as well. If you look down at the temperatures in the bottom left there, um, these are forecast maximum temperatures for the 28th of December. So this is kind of before the fires got going. Um, we don't need the extreme temperatures on the day. Um, we got them on Black Saturday, but the, the week before where we had temperatures in the mid 40s um, for consecutive days really adds with low, low relative humidity, it really adds to the curing of fuel. Um, and that's what we saw here as well. December was um, notable for the intense heat wave that occurred in the middle of the month and continued on um, up to the fire um, fires themselves. We also had fires burning in the landscape already, and that's a really significant factor. So the FFDIs on the days um, where we had fire activity in these regions were highest on record, driven largely by wind and humidity, not by temperature. But as well as worrying about ignitions that could start on that day, we had significant fires already burning in the landscape from November. In fact, I think only the Cabago fire probably required ignition during this event. Um, there was fires already in the landscape for the other fires. So from a management perspective, um, operationally, um, that makes things harder and it's, um, you know, tagging back to the things I've talked about, about trends for rainfall in the cool season and the early start to the fire season. Um, this is the sort of uh, practical outcome of those changes. Going to the next slide, please. Um, I will just spend briefly on fire-generated thunderstorms. So um, the events that we saw since spring, really, but most notably over December and January, we saw a lot of what's called pyrocumulonimbus or pyro CBs or fire-generated thunderstorms. So this is where you have fires burning in 
heavily forested areas, um, they generate their own weather. So they generate their own thunderstorms. Um, these are a significant risk to fighting fires as well as fire spread. So they change winds at the fire front and, and aloft above the fires. Um, they increase transport of burning embers. Um, they have additional sources of lightning to start new fires. And at a, at a um, small spatial scales, we get um, tornadoes and extreme winds. So Southern Australia has, in the evidence we have, seen an increased number of high-risk days for fire-generated thunderstorms, and the projections are for that trend to continue. Um, examples this century is Canberra 2003, um, Black Saturday, and many instances um, over the last fire season. We can go to the next slide. So just summarising those changes to fire weather, a longer fire season um, arriving earlier in spring, most notably, um, accompanied by more extreme heat waves, including in spring. Um, that influences things I haven't talked about here, so overnight temperature and humidity, for example, where you might get some moisture back into the fuel um, is affected by the incidence of extreme heat waves. Um, lower rainfall during the cooler months in some fire prone regions of the southwest and the southeast. Hotter drought periods, so giving a little extra push to um, drawing moisture out of the environment when particularly during the drying phases. Um, and evidence of more favourable environments for fire-generated thunderstorms. I can go to the next slide. I'm going to finish here with a brief discussion of climate projections and just noting that our colleagues from CSIRO will treat this topic in more detail. So if we can go to the next slide, just to complete the narrative, I'm going to focus on fire weather itself for the projections, but before I do that, just looking at the way we do climate projections globally, so the dark black line here is Australian average temperature with that 1.4 degree warming trend. Um, the orange and green lines are projected changes to Australian average temperature. The orange is what's called a future, let's call it a business as usual emission scenario where global emissions of greenhouse gases continue at a similar rate to what they have historically. And the green line there is a stabilisation and very, very low um, future projected greenhouse gas um, um, emissions pathway. Um, for a lot of the work that the Bureau does, we're looking over the next 20 to 30 years where the emission scenario matters less. Why is that um, over that period, the global climate system is going to continue to warm in response to greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere. So the oceans take a while to respond to that additional radiative forcing, so the extra energy from um, extra greenhouse gases, and that's what we'll see over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years or so. But the projections I'm going to show follow a high emissions scenario. We can go to the next slide. Now, there's a couple of ways we can look at projections for fire weather. This is a projection for a future climatology in fire weather. What does that mean? We look at a future 20-year period and average fire weather over that 20-year period from our models. And I've chosen three models here to show that we also look at where the models provide certainty, where they all agree, and where the models um, provide some information on uncertainty, where they agree less. But the take home from this um, particular projection, which is for future climatologies, 20 year climatologies in days above 25 FFDI and days in the 95th percentile, is that we're getting increases over most of the country during that period. Can I go to the next slide, please? Here is another way to look at projections. So, in the previous slide, we looked at 20 year averages. This is looking at just heat waves themselves. So now we need to look at weather um, over multiple days. So if you remember at the start, I talked about the events of uh, Black Saturday, so the heat wave leading into that in 2009, and I talked about the heat wave in January 2013. This is what the Bureau's weather model um, sees when it looks at those events. So we take real world data, observed data, and put that through the weather model, and you can see the extreme temperatures there, um, the darks are above 48s for the two historical events. What we have on the right there is the future global climate model, a high emission scenario, and then we take that data and give it to the weather model, and it shows us what the weather would be for that event. We've chosen a meteorological event that is similar to Black Saturday here, and nominally it, it occurs in January 2050, but the way we run these models is we run lots of simulations, and then we would look for an event in the future that looks like Black Saturday with the additional warming factored in, 
and look at what that looks like. And this is the sort of work that is now being done increasingly to look at forward planning for extreme hazards and events. So now we're looking at the heat wave itself rather than the climatology. If we can go to the next slide. We can drill down from the heat wave, so multiple days of heat, to days of fire danger. So now we're looking at single days where we're not just looking at heat, we're actually looking at um, rainfall, temperature, humidity, wind, and all the factors that we know influence fire weather. The top panel shows the um, FFDI, extreme FFDI that we observed over 2nd of January, 3rd of January, 4th of January this year, compared with that same period that I showed earlier um, for January 2015 in the Australian climate model. Um, and, you, and again, what we're looking at here is an intensification of the fire weather into the future. So that's where my talk ends. Um, thanks for listening. Dr Braganza, thanks uh, for that. Uh, just a question uh, from me, and I'll, then I'll open it to the Commissioners just for a, a couple of questions. That was an excellent overview and really sets the baseline for the Commission to, to consider what we need to as we move forward. Just a question for you. Obviously, you would have made uh, tighter predictions as we move through 2019 uh, leading up to the season. About mid-2019, when you were starting to provide advice uh, to those committees and that that, uh, that, that look at uh, what's coming up in the fire season, how did it play out in real, time, real life vice what you had predicted leading up to it, please? Yeah, I think if we look before the 2018-2019 and 2019-2020 fire seasons, we were probably providing similar advice um, just due to the drought. And then when we look in 2019 preceding the season just gone, we were also getting strong indications from our forecasts of the seasonal drivers, particularly the IOD and the Southern Annular Mode, that we were going to favour drier and hotter conditions. And um, thankfully for our forecasts, at least, that's how things turned out. But unfortunately, the conditions turned out to be very severe. So things really played out the way um, our forecast models, both in climate and weather, um, um, suggested they would. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Dr Bennett? Um, thanks, Dr Gans. I've just got one question. Uh, I saw that you were modelling forward to 2050. Um, can I bring it back to a shorter time frame? Uh, are you able to, to give us some analysis of the modelling you've done over, let's say, the next five years? It's very difficult to predict climate more than about nine months to a year in advance. So the predictability that we get over that period in Australia largely comes from what the El Nino Southern Oscillation is doing in the Pacific, and that's why it's important to understand those modes. So, for example, going into the next fire season, we have conditions favouring um, wetter conditions over Australia this year than we had in the preceding two years. And that's largely, um, our knowledge of that is largely to do with what the Pacific Ocean is doing. Once you go beyond that time scale, um, it becomes very difficult. Um, there's enough chaos in the climate system that such predictions become difficult. So now we look at those time scales um, probabilistically. So over the next five years, um, you will be looking at the background trends. The thing to really understand about that 2050 projection is it's not a projection specifically for what, it's not a prediction of what is going to happen in 2050. We could look over the models, um, if we ran the model, the models enough, so you ran the models thousands of times, you would probably find an extreme fire event in one of those simulations over the next 5, 10 or 20 years. And that's really comes down to the luck you have with the drivers that occur at that time. So while the change in average, average climate is going to proceed decade by decade. Changes in extremes can occur within that period because they're influenced by um, natural climate variability. So really what we're looking at is what's possible over the next 10, 20, 30 year time frame for both average climate and extremes. So we're looking at those extremes that we have in our models as case studies for what is possible over the next period. And then how you use that information really comes down to what you want to do. So if you need to look at what worst case scenarios are, you might just say, look, 
show me what a worst case scenario is from the modeling. Or if you're wanting to do some staged adaptation, then you might look at how the averages are changing. Does that help answer your question? It, it does. And if I can just follow on with one more on that. So um, bring it back now to the next, let's say, 12 to 24 months. And bearing in mind that in the historically, these extreme events have not been every year, although, you know, things have been changing. To what extent can you talk about the likelihood of an extreme fire event, for example, occurring in the next year or two, bearing in mind that these trends are still happening? Do you, know what, do you understand my question? Sure. Yes, I totally do. So the natural drivers won't reinforce the trends in every year, and that's why we will get, you know, year-to-year um, -year variability. Um, looking um, at the, the year to date, we've had um, a lot more rainfall than we've had in 2018 or 2019 already. And the drivers that we look at look like they're favouring over the next nine months or so um, neutral or slightly wetter conditions for Australia. Now, that may or may not happen, but at this point, what we would be, look, what we'd be saying is um, your chances of getting the sort of season that you saw in 2018, 2019 and 2019, 2020 are reduced. So what we're going to do now is really look at the amount of rainfall that falls between now and the start of spring to keep um, updating and reinforcing that outlook. Beyond that, um, it's difficult to say, except that the trends probably load the dice towards um, worse fire seasons in general. So unless it rains a lot in 2021, um, you would expect on average to have a significant fire season without any other influences. I'll put that in context. When you look over the 20th century, there's only two significant wet periods for Australia. That is around 2010, 11 and 12, where we had a record-breaking La Nina event, and then in 2016, where we had a really significant negative IOD event. Apart from that, it has been hot and dry. So that is, if you're a water manager and you're looking at your baseline, um, they really don't look beyond the millennium drought, looking backwards, for how to set their baseline. And I think that's the kind of framing that is increasingly being used for hazards as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner McIntosh. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Braganza, for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, in your presentation, you put a slide about the south coast showing that the earliest date where we're seeing a plus 25 FFDI um, is now around July or maybe August. Can you tell us when the latest date in, say, summer or autumn is when we um, when we're getting the, uh, we're basically when that season is ending. Yes, I can. For that location, I think it's about a month later. So we are extending the fire season at, at both ends. Um, and for Eastern Victoria and, and, and South, uh, South Coast New South Wales, um, I think it's, it's around 21 days or a month into autumn as well. Some of that, I should say, might be natural variability because, um, you know, we would have influence of El Nino events and other things during that period, um, but we think a significant fraction of it is the trend. So just to follow that up, so when you say a month later, what does that mean? What date are we talking in, in, in autumn? Um, I would have to check, but I would say that's pushing things further into April. Thanks, Dr. Braganza. The, the, um, sorry, the, the fire season um, in eastern New South Wales tends to end earlier, and in, and in South East Queensland earlier again. So um, once you get easterlies pushing in off the Pacific, it tends to increase the humidity and you get um, less frequent fire weather. When you get westerlies pushing off the continent is when you get significant fire weather for those locations. And so protracted drought, which means that those westerlies are just pretty much um, flowing over very dry parched landscapes um, is significant in that regard. So the end to the fire season and start um, varies in different parts of the country. Commissioner Ben. Yes, I've just got one more question and maybe um, I, I, forgive me if, I, if, I, if uh, I'm wrong, but I, I remember that during the course of the last fire season, there was a lot of talk of wind unpredictability. Is there anything, any of the work that you've done here that you've described that can tell us a little bit about the predictability of the winds during the course of the fire season? Where they're coming from um, that kind and the changes? Oh, 
So um, wind is generally well forecast at particular scales. Um, in terms of the forecasts for things like phenomena such as fire-generated thunderstorms, that becomes more difficult. Um, I believe um, there's a number of factors that make um, the prediction of wind difficult at those timescales. So um, topography is one of them, for example. So doing forecasts in regions where there's lots of mountains um, and you have to have regard for fires on upslopes and downslopes um, can become tricky. Um, the forecasts are generally pretty good, um, but you would have to ask a meteorologist, so a forecast specialist, those questions rather than me, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Braganza. Ms. hogan -Dora. Dr. Braganza, I apologise. I did not um, take the commissioners to your curriculum vitae in any detail, and I should have done so, which might have assisted. You're the head of climate monitoring at Australian Bureau of Meteorology. That's correct. And you have a Bachelor of Science with an <clears throat> honours first class in meteorology and physics from the University correct. of Melbourne. Sorry and a PhD in climatology from the School of Mathematics at the Monash University. Correct. And in your role as, climate, as head of climate monitoring, you're responsible for the preparation and analysis of Australia's instrumental climate record and the official reporting of climate change in Australia. Correct. And you're responsible for the Bureau's climate risk services to government. Yes, I'm a significant liaison point for getting that information across. Commissioners, um, that's all I propose to take Dr Braganza to today. There will be an institutional response from the Bureau provided in due course and uh, other representatives of the Bureau to assist you during the course of this inquiry. Might Dr Braganza be excused? Dr Braganza can be excused. I'd like to thank him very much. It was, uh, as I said before, a very good overview uh, for the Commission. Is that a convenient time to adjourn for? I think the Commission will take a break and we will, a short break, and we'll uh, look to come back at uh, 11.30 local time. Commission, Thank you. Please. Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Commissioners, Junior Council assisting Ms. Ampakapathy will take the next witness. Ms. Ampakapathy. Commissioners, first I will tender a PDF version of a PowerPoint presentation prepared by Dr. Helen Clue and Dr. Michael Gross from the CSIRO. That is at tab eight of your bundle and it has a document identification identification number CSI.505.001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001
I also tender a copy of Dr. Helen Clue's curriculum vitae, which is in tab nine of your bundle. That is document CSI 502.001.0001. And I tender a copy of Dr. Gross's curriculum vitae, which is at tab 10 of your bundle. Document number CSI.502.001.0001. Zero, 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 0003. And I tender those documents as a bundle 1.2, each with the identification 1.2.1 down to 1.2.3. So those documents will be received uh, as marked. Thank you. I call Dr. Helen Clue and Dr. Michael Gross. Dr. Clue, Dr. Gross, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Dr. Clue, thank you. can you take an oath or an affirmation? Affirmation. Associate, could you please administer the affirmation? Dr. Clue, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do so affirm. Dr. Gross, will you take an oath or an affirmation? I do so confirm. Oh, sorry, affirmation. Dr. Gross, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do so confirm. Thank you. Dr. Clue, you have prepared a presentation with Dr. Gross for the Commission? Yes, I have. And Dr Gross, you have prepared a presentation with Dr Clue for the Commission? Yes. Commissioners, that's at tab nine of your bundle. Thank you. Uh, Commissioners, the version that will be played during hearing is an animated version and the version that's in the court book and in the tender bundle is a PDF version of that presentation. Uh, we have it at tab eight. Thank you. Dr. Clue, you have also prepared a curriculum vitae for the Commission. Yes, I have. Commissioners, that's at tab nine of your bundle. Thank you. Dr. Clue, you are the senior principal research science scientist at the CSIRO Climate Science Centre. Yes, I am. And you have previously been the director of the CSIRO Climate Science Centre. Yes, I was. And you have a Bachelor in Science with first honours, first class honours in physical geography from the University of Otago in New Zealand. Yes. And you have a PhD in atmospheric science from the University of British Columbia. Yes. And you are currently the Vice Chair of the World Climate Research Program Joint Scientific Committee. Yes, I am. And a member of the Antarctic Science Platform Steering Group for New Zealand. Yes, I am. And a member of the UK Met Office Partnership Board. Um, I no longer am on that partnership board. That was a role that was associated with my former position as Director of the Climate Science Centre. So I'm no longer a member of that board. I see. So was that from 2017 until 2019? Early 2020, January 28th. And are you a member of the National Climate Science Advisory Committee? I was. That committee has paused at the moment, but I was, yes. And Dr. Gross, you have also prepared a curriculum vitae for the Commission. I have. Commission yes. Is that, at, is that tab 10? Thank you. Dr. Gross, you're currently a senior research scientist at the CSIRO Climate Science Centre in Hobart. Yes, I am. And you are the lead author on the IPCC sixth assessment report. 
I'm a lead author, yes, I am. And you have a PhD from the University of Tasmania in Oceans and Atmospheric Science? Yes, I have. Evidence, Evidence Operator, could you please pull up the presentation? When you're ready, Dr. Clue and Dr. Gross, you may start your presentation. Thank you, Ms. Amber Capathy. So this presentation provides firstly a brief explanation of weather and climate prediction and the climate drivers that affect Australia's weather and climate. And secondly, it describes CSIRO's climate modelling and national climate projections that inform our understanding of future weather and climate related risks and hazards. Operator, could we go to the next slide please? As you are now aware from their presentation this morning, the Bureau of Meteorology provide weather forecasts for the days out to a week ahead and seasonal climate outlooks for one to three months ahead. CSIRO focuses on climate and climate change over multi-decadal to centennial timescales. Our modelling of future climate provides the knowledge, information and foresighting for impact and risk assessments and adaptation planning across many, many sectors. CSIRO have been doing global and regional climate modelling and developing projections of future climates for over three decades. It's important to note here that while climate models do simulate the variability that exists in the climate system, long-term climate projections are not the same as a forecast of what the weather will be like on a particular day or even year into the future. Operator, could we have the next slide, please? Bridging this gap between shorter-term weather forecasts and longer-term climate projections to predict what the climate might be like in, say, one to two years' time is recognised as a substantial scientific challenge, but one that is of great societal relevance and benefit. Recognising this, in 2017, CSIRO embarked upon a long-term decadal forecasting project whose mission is to develop a multi-year to decadal climate forecasting capability for the benefit of Australia. Operator, could we go to the next slide, please? This slide shows a schematic of the processes and phenomena which we call the climate drivers that influence Australia's weather and climate. The main climate drivers are the trio of ENSO, which affects rainfall, especially in eastern Australia, the Indian Ocean Dipole, which affects drought and bushfire risk, and the Southern Annular Mode, or SAM, which also played a role in the windy conditions that led up to the 2019 bushfire season. There are also features of our meridional or north-south circulation, which affects the location of the subtropical ridge, that affects the location in turn of our anticyclones, and also the passage and location of rain-bearing fronts. The Bureau of Meteorology will have already explained the influence that these drivers have on our weather and climate on seasonal and multi-year timescales. My key point here is that these drivers are also affected by climate change. And this means that Australia's future climate will be influenced both by the direct effects of global warming associated with climate change and changes in these drivers that are also affected by climate change. If we could go to the next slide, please, operator. This table is a summary of how these drivers modulate Australia's climate risk. For example, the El Nino phenomenon, or climate driver, is linked to increased risk of drought, heat and temperature extremes, and reduced risk of floods, while La Nina events are linked to reduced fire danger but increased flood risk. And I'd like to note that in the entry under the SAM um, driver, SAM positive and SAM negative, the increased and decreased unfortunately got um, trans, um, reversed in the transposition. So I want to make the point very clear that a negative southern annular mode does um, come with increased risk of fire danger, not decreased, as you can see 
on the slide, so there was an error there. Research to date indicates that in a warming climate, the frequency of extreme El Nino, La Nina, and Indian Ocean dipole events will increase, leading to more extreme weather events in the future. This means that understanding the interaction between climate variability and these drivers and climate change is very important for building preparedness for the changing nature of climate risks into the future. Perhaps put more simply, climate change means that the past is no longer a guide to future climate-related impacts and risks. Could we go to the next slide, please? So climate modelling and climate projections for decades or centuries into the future need to account for the fact that there are multiple future trajectories that are all possible. We don't know which of these will eventuate. And the climate that we will experience in the future depends on three factors that are listed there. Firstly, the internal or natural climate variability <coughs> that arises as a result of these drivers that we spoke to in the earlier slide. It also very much depends on the emissions of the atmospheric constituents that interact with the climate and cause climate change. This is especially greenhouse gases, but also aerosols and other atmospheric uh, constituents. And I'll describe these more on the next slide. The third element is the response of the climate system, which will lead to a range of plausible future climates depending on the scenario over, of emissions. As you can see in the plot, which is of global temperatures, the long-term trend, which is superimposed by the year-to-year -year and longer variability, which is illustrating this natural climate variability. If we could go to the next slide, please, operator. This is to explain in a little bit more detail this concept of future climate emissions. Because we don't know what they're going to be, we need to represent the range of possible future emissions which affect the climate response. So our climate models um, need to represent this range, and they do that using um, the representative concentration pathways, or RCPs for short. And the plot on the left-hand side shows the RCPs that have been agreed to by the climate modelling community to use so that we've got a consistent approach. The number that's associated indicates essentially the extra energy that is um, introduced into the climate system as a result of the emission of greenhouse gases and other radiatively active constituents. So the RCP 8.5 is a high emissions RCP and a 2.6 would be a low emissions RCP and the 2.6 refers to the extra energy. So using these RCPs mean that we can explore a future with a, where we have strong mitigation with lower greenhouse gas emissions or and a future with very high ongoing net uh, greenhouse gas emissions or a future that's in between. So if we could go to the next slide, please. And if you can hit enter to bring up the animation, thank you, which will just be on a continuous loop. So as I said, the future climate that we experience is a combination of all three factors. The graph is a time series of Australia's observed temperatures in black, both the annual and a longer term running mean from 1910 through to the present, and then a sequence in the animation of future climate simulations for three RCPs. You will see this coming through, the red one being the high RCP 8.5, the, the um, blue being an intermediate RCP 4.5, and green the low RCP of 2.6. You can see as these, um, this animation of future climate realisations uh, plays, you can see that the, the response varies between models because the very squiggly lines that you are seeing are actually the realisations of two different models. And you can see that their response to the forcing, the greenhouse gas emissions and so on, is actually slightly different. It also shows us that superimposed on this long-term trend is the interannual variability, where we have warm years and cold years superimposed on the long-term trend. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. 
So it's also important to quantify our confidence in climate projections. Best practice is to base these confidence assessments on evidence and agreement. This is using the IPCC method, um, recommended method, which ensures consistency across all the modelling uh, efforts that are made by modelling groups around the world. This concept of evidence and agreement uh, contributing to our confidence is shown in the matrix on the top right-hand corner. So you can see that where we have high agreement between different models with robust evidence, that um, means that we have strong confidence in that result. And the table that sits underneath that matrix gives us the quantitative measure of that confidence. So a statement like Australia will warm substantially through the 21st century and that is a very high confidence statement means that at least 9 out of 10 chance of that statement being correct. The Australia's national climate projections, which I'll describe soon, actually use five lines of evidence to uh, ascribe confidence. And they're shown in the graphic on the left-hand side. That includes into comparison across a number of different models. That includes our process understanding, the evaluation of those models. And importantly, where we have hilly terrain or coastal regions, we use downscaling to provide finer scale information of future climate. If I could go to the next slide, please, uh, operator. Thank you. So CSIRO have been undertaking long-term climate projections for over 30 years, providing the credible and relevant climate information that's needed to inform planning and decision-making. Our preferred approach is to align the production of our national projections, along, uh, align that to the IPCC assessment report cycle, which is currently about seven years. This is because the IPCC's climate assessments are supported by a coordinated climate model into comparison project called CMIP. And that provides the latest results from the latest global climate models that have been produced by all the modelling centres around the world. That delivers a multi-model database that can be drawn upon to develop our climate projections. It also allows us to ensure that we're bringing in the latest science and the latest understanding to uh, embark upon a cycle of continuous, or enabling a cycle of continuous improvement in our projections. And you can see that in the timeline in the top right-hand corner, which shows the sequence from the early days in the late 80s, early 90s, where our information on future climate was more based on expert judgment and science through to the present, of the, through 2015 where we delivered the climate change in Australia climate projections that I'll come to in a moment. And it's really fair to say that the science of developing climate projections over those three decades has been transformed um, to delivering the state of the science that we have done in 2015. So if I go to the next slide, please. Because we've been doing this for nearly three decades or more than three decades, it means we can look back and answer the question, well, how well did our projections capture what has been experienced? And this chart does this for one climate variable. This is temperature. So you can see the observations of temperature in the black line. And the red wedge or plume shows the projections that were made in the early 90s of temperature in Australia for the decades ahead. And you can see that the temperature observations have been within the projected range. Now this is for temperature, of course there are other climate variables that are important too. So it's important to know that the observed climate over the last decade and more is very consistent with many of the changes that were being described in those earlier projections, both in terms of the sign or direction of change and often in the magnitude. And this is in our climate um, information such as rates of sea level and amounts of sea level rise, increased heat extremes, and increasing extreme fire weather. Go to the next slide, please. So as, as I've indicated, the most comprehensive set of nationally consistent climate projections for regional Australia, including our coasts, was delivered in 2015 through the Climate Change in Australia project. The primary goal of that was to provide climate projections for impact assessment and adaptation planning, especially in the natural resources management sector. 
Some of the key features of these projections are illustrated in the graphic on the right-hand side. The key point I want to make here is that these climate projections are credible and salient, and most importantly, they are still current in 2020. This is because the science methods and approach were and remain best practice, and they use the latest full set of climate models. I want to also note that CSIRO work with many of the states and territories around Australia to produce nationally consistent and high resolution climate projections to meet the needs of the jurisdictions, especially information about extreme weather and climate events and related risks. Uh, could I go to the next slide, please? Thank you. The biennial state of the climate is an important report on Australia's climate variability and long-term climate trends, which we produce jointly with the Bureau of Meteorology. The 2018 state of the climate also included global and national climate projections, including this summary. And if you could just um, bring up the next table by hitting enter. Thank you. So many of the long-term climate trends that are already being experienced in Australia now will continue into the future. For example, ongoing global warming and warming in our region, rising sea levels, a decline in cool season rainfall in southeast and southwestern Australia, and harsher fire weather conditions in southern and eastern Australia, all the points that you can see in the summary from the state of the climate. If we could go to the next slide, please. This means that climate change is adding to Australia's natural climate variability, driving changes in extreme weather and increasing climate impacts on our water resources, ecosystems, health, infrastructure and economy, both now and continuing into the future. This slide is a summary of some of these climate-related impacts, risks and hazards. In the next sequence of slides, I will go through those six climate projections that you can see there to do with temperatures, fire weather, rainfall, rainfall extremes, tropical cyclones and sea levels. This summary is to give an indication of some of the impacts that are associated. For example, hotter temperatures both over land leading to more heat waves and in the oceans leading to marine heat waves will have impacts on human health, on our ecosystems and on productivity. It also, in the colder parts of Australia, will mean reduced winter mortality for people and livestock, and where crop production is limited by cold, then we might see improved productivity. So if we can go to the next slide, please, to go through the projections mostly from climate change in Australia. So this is a time series graph the brown line shows our observations and showing that Australia has warmed over the last century, reaching 1.4 degrees by the end of 2019, since reliable records began in 1910. Sorry, I have to wave to get the lights on. Um, I'll keep talking. Um, it also shows that Australia will continue to warm substantially during the 21st century. There is very high confidence that mean daily minimum and maximum temperatures will continue to increase throughout the century for all regions in Australia with more frequent and hotter hot days. And if you'll excuse me just to stand up so that I can get the lights on, it will be better for us all. So my apologies for this. Feel free. <laughs> it's an energy saving measure, but I've been sitting too still. It's working. It's taking a while. I know. It's taking a while to wake up. Thank you, Dr. Clues. Please take your time. <laughs> My apologies for that interruption. Continuing with uh, the information that's on this slide. So under a high emission scenario, this warming will be large compared to natural variability, both in the near future, say around 2030, with high confidence, and by 2090, late in the, in the century, with very high confidence. So I just want to reiterate the point, seeing that we had the interruption there with the lighting. The key message here that Australia will continue to warm substantially, and that is a very high confidence statement. By way of illustration, 
By mid-century, what this means is that the temperature that was recorded in Australia in 2013, which was Australia's warmest year on record at that time, that warmest year on record by mid-century under a high emissions RCP 8.5 scenario would be a cool year or under a low emission scenario of 2.6 would be an average temperature year. And I'd further note that since this uh, chart or graph has been published, 2019, so last year, surpassed 2013 to be Australia's warmest year on record. So if we could go to the next Oh, please. This map shows the, uh, the additional number of hot days. Uh, for the 20 years centred on 2090, so towards the end of the century, for a intermediate emission scenario of, um, or RCP of 4.5, for many of our major cities in Australia. This projected 50% increase in very hot days in many of our cities will likely have substantial impacts, for example, on the health of people living in our cities, especially the elderly and vulnerable, on the productivity of our workforce, on energy demand and on infrastructure. If you go to the next slide, please. Along with temperature, rainfall is very important for Australia. And the Climate Change in Australia project projections or project are concluded with regard to rainfall that, and it's captured in the picture there, that winter and spring rainfall is projected to decline in southern Australia. Increases or decreases are possible elsewhere and in other regions. The graph on the right-hand side shows an example for rainfall variability and change in southern Australia for two RCPs, RCP 4.5 and 8.5. While the cool season rainfall is highly variable, which you can see in the observations, which are the brown line, as we've already indicated, there is an observed long-term drying trend in southern Australia, especially in the southwest and in the southeast. The projections of declining winter and spring rainfall into the future, which is a high confidence projection or statement, means that this drying trend will continue, although there will be continuing large natural variability. This variability will exceed the trend, especially in the shorter term, so the next decade or so, and especially for the intermediate emission scenario, or RCP 4.5. If we could go to the next slide, please. The combination of extreme heat and lower rainfall both contribute to the risk of extreme fire weather, especially in southern Australia. Now, this result you've already heard from this morning, I'm sure, from the Bureau of Meteorology because it's research that was done by the Bureau in collaboration with CSIRO. So the, the, the maps that you can see are a map showing the change in the number of dangerous fire weather days. That's where the forest fire danger index exceeds 25 between the current climate and in the future, 2060 to 2080, so later this century. And you can see in the map the, the key message that we that the research has shown, and that's captured in the in the gold box on the right hand side, that fire danger is very likely to increase in the future. That's exacerbated by the increased occurrence of extreme heat events. This these dangerous weather conditions for bushfires are likely to occur at least in part due to increasing greenhouse gas emissions. And the other key point that I'm sure the Bureau also explained is that the effect um, that this fire weather has in terms of um, extreme pyroconvection, which can contribute to dry lightning and therefore provide an ignition source, but also affects the spread of fires. So the risk of fire danger is both due to the long-term drying and warming, which is um, conditioning the landscape, but also the extreme fire weather that is uh, observed partly due to climate change. And the other point I just make is that the three maps, you might be wondering why there's three. There's three different modelling approaches used there, a global climate model and two regional models. And the, the model agreement is quite consistent between the three. Can we go to the next slide, please? So 
So extreme heat and low of rainfall not only have an influence on bushfire weather, but also on droughts. And droughts are important for many reasons. Droughts actually precondition the landscape for fires. We've just talked about that. But they also have large impact on our rural communities, on our agricultural production, our water resources and our ecosystems. So the Climate Change in Australia project, um, the projections from that project, stated that the time in drought um, would increase. That's a high confidence statement uh, with a greater frequency of severe droughts. That's a medium confidence statement. That's partly due to the lower rainfall in the cool season, which we've talked about before, the long-term drying trend, and also increased evaporation, which increases the soil moisture deficit. The maps that you can see on the right-hand side are actually for some, from some new research. It's still under review, uh, as you can see there in the text, so it's not published yet. Uh, that confirms the earlier conclusion from the climate change in Australia results. This research again draws across a multi-model ensemble from the CMIP5 database. It's the, the plots are for the projected percentage change in meteorological drought, that is rainfall deficit for Australia. Um, and it does this for four attributes or features of drought, the percent time in drought, the mean duration, the frequency, and the intensity per event. The columns just show the, the, the range of the models. There are 37 global climate models contributing to this result. The finding of that new research is that the median projections for percent time in drought, mean drought duration, and intensity per drought event are all mostly increased in the 21st century compared to last century. The median projections result do show for drought a small decrease in drought frequency. The authors conclude that while projections do show a large range across the different models, nonetheless there is strong agreement in the projections of increasing drought and extreme drought, especially in southwest WA and southeastern Australia. Projections also showed intensification of drought and extreme drought for all regions of Australia in the future. We could go to the next slide, please. This next slide actually now goes back to rainfall because in terms of climate hazard, heavy rainfall is important. The Climate Change in Australia projections found that extreme rainfall events are projected to increase intensity with high confidence. That's both in terms of the wettest day of the year and the wettest day in 20 years. Although what this means is that although mean rainfall is declining in southern Australia, the rainfall events that we experience will be more intense. The figure that you can see now shows the percentage change by the end of the century. So it's not a time series. It's showing the change by the end of the century uh, for both mean rainfall on the left-hand side and the wettest day and the wettest day in 20 years. The purple and pink bars show the range in, in projections across the different models for the two RCPs that you can see there. The grey bar is the contribution from natural variability. The graphic simply reinforces the key message that extreme rainfalls are projected to increase in intensity. State of the Climate in 2018 notes that these increases in short duration rain extremes, which are already being observed, are often associated with flash flooding. So this means that there is an increased risk of flash, flash flooding into the future, especially in small catchments, where the response to rainfall is very rapid, and also urbanised catchments, where the impervious cover is, is large. So there are flow-on impacts that will result from this, including erosion uh, and sediments that have influences on water quality in lakes and rivers and, and other storages. We could go to the next slide, please. Tropical cyclones, of course, are an important feature of Australia's climate, um, obviously typically obviously in the north, and another contributor to extreme rainfall events. Climate Change in Australia project um, did provide projections of tropical cyclone frequency and intensity. This research has been updated in more recent years with new research uh, by CSIRO um, as part of a, a, a 
national research program. So that research concluded, um, again using the CMIT-5 multi-model ensemble or database, that climate models project a future decrease in the total number of tropical cyclones, but an increase in the proportion of high intensity storms, that is stronger winds and greater rainfall. The um, graphic on the right hand side simply um, is the information that sits underneath that statement for Western Australia, rest of Western region, to the west of Australia, including Western Australia and the Eastern region, and for Australian region as a whole. Again, this is a change in frequency by the end of the century. The coloured bars now are not for two different RCPs. This is only for a high emission scenario, RCP 8.5, but for two methods of extracting tropical cyclone information out of the global climate model simulations. Again, the solid bar is the median and the the length of the rectangle indicates the range. And you can see there a reduced frequency in tropical cyclones consistent um, for each of the regions. The important point here for impacts and hazards is that we will see increased impact, especially in our coasts, not only from the uh, increased intensity of tropical cyclones, but that often coincides um, with the impact of rising sea levels. And so this, I'd like to now go to the next slide where we talk about sea level rise. Thank you. So climate change in Australia concluded that by 2090, global sea levels are projected to rise by between 26 and 55 centimetres for an RCP of 2.6 to 45 to 82 centimetres for an RCP of 8.5. This is a medium confidence statement. This is because um, it depends on factors such as ice sheet melting, but there is also regional variability and differences as well. The time series on the right-hand side is actually from the IPCC fifth assessment, showing observations of global mean sea level uh, changes from 1700 through to the present from an, a different, a quite a large array of observational types, and then projections into the future for two RCPs. Now, if I could ask the operator to just hit enter to bring up um, another graphic and some more text. Thank you. So sea level rise for Australia will be similar, possibly slightly larger than these global projections. The example in the graph that you can see is actually for Sydney to provide a local example. This is again observed sea level rise for Sydney from 1950 through to the present from both the tide gauge record and the altimeter um, record. And then projections actually for all the RCPs out to 2100. The dashed lines that you can see there are an estimate of the interannual variability. The other solid lines are, as you've seen with earlier R slides, showing the median and the range of the projections for the different RCPs. The key message here is that rising sea levels will po or are already and will continue to pose a threat coastal communities and coastal infrastructure by amplifying the risks of coastal inundation and storm surge. I'll conclude here with, uh, by noting that for the next few decades, the rates of sea level rise both globally and, and here in Australia are partially locked in by our past emissions. But as we look further into the later this century and to centuries beyond that, beyond 2100, those sea level projections critically depend on the greenhouse gas emissions from now onwards. Um, with both ocean thermal expansion, which contributes to sea level rise, and the effect of ice sheets, uh, potentially contributing very large amounts of sea level rise over many, many centuries ahead under higher greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Dr. Clue, just a couple of questions and then uh, we can go to, to Dr. Gross. If I take that last uh, part that you just said, that, that summary, um, even with RCPs and emissions reduced to as low as what, what would be envisaged, we're still going to see a worsening of natural disasters at least over the, the next century. Is that the way I take that? 
Yes, you are correct in that um, some of it, depending on the extreme events, um, there's an element of um, locked in, that some of these are locked in because of the missions that we've already had, yes. Nonetheless, um, we can have a significant um, amelioration of some of those impacts um, into, by, by addressing uh, emissions into the future. Um, Commissioner, if it's uh, okay with you, uh, Dr. Gross is um, our technical expert on many of these aspects. And uh, if it's okay with you, Commissioner, I'd like to ask him if he would like to add some um, more detailed comments to that question. Yes, please, Dr. Uh, Gross. Thank you, Dr. Oh, thank you, Dr. Clue. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, nothing much to add in the interest of time, other than I support the statements you've made. It's a little bit different for different types of extremes and disasters, but that general um, case is very much uh, true. There is also perhaps the other um, wild card that people talk about of uh, climate engineering to counter some of the effects of climate change, but that's very speculative. Um, and, and not at all um, something we, we account for in the current climate projections. Uh, thanks for that. And, and would that uh, affect us in the next 10 to 20 years, if that was to, to happen? It's very speculative at the moment, um, and there's a lot of reasons to be very cautious about employing climate engineering. It needs a lot more research into it. Um, so it's very unknown, even more unknown than the emission scenario will follow, whether the world will employ any climate engineering to tackle climate change. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, that comment. Uh, Commissioner Bennett. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm just intrigued by one comment that you made at the, almost at the beginning, and and then another reference later, and I just want to understand a little bit about SAM and the impact of that on the wind, and you said it in southern Australia. So I've got a couple of questions. One is, how far into southern Australia does that impact, um, is that impact felt? Secondly, how predictable is it, or, or what, you know, how do we know whether it's going to happen or not over the next, uh, let's say, few years? And the third question is, in that same thing, does that have any interconnection with the increase in the, da in the dangerous um, pyroconvection conditions for southern Australia. So it, it, it's dealing with, you know, to the extent to which it has an impact, it may, may not have one, and you can tell me then that's, that's the answer to that, but how far in does it go and what do we do with the predictability of it? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for that question. Um, SAM plays an important role in Australia's climate, particularly where the westerlies um, shifting that belt of westerlies. And again, if it's okay with you, uh, Commissioner, I'd like to bring Dr. Gross in here, again, because he has great technical expertise on these climate drivers and the influence that they have on Australia's climate. So I'll pass to Dr. Gross. Thanks, Dr. Clue, Dr. Gross. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clue, and thank you, Commissioner. Yes, as, as Dr. Clue mentioned, um, SAM affects the latitude and strength of the westerly wind belt that affects the climate of southern Australia. It also then has a flow and effect to the um, climate, uh, seasonal climate of parts of eastern Australia as well, because that westerly wind build has flow and effects. Um, it, so the effect varies by season and by region. However, it is um, generally it, um, associated with um, uh, high fire danger when it's in certain phases of SAM. And this was the case uh, last year in the lead up to the 2019-20 um, uh, bushfire season, there was uh, a strong Indian Ocean dipole event, but also SAM conditions were favourable towards uh, encouraging bushfire. And this was also linked in part to a, a, a periodic event called a sudden stratospheric warming south of Australia as well. So those, those, all of those three drivers uh, were important, and those were um, documented in the Bureau of Meteorology seasonal outlooks and seasonal um, uh, reports. Uh, from last year. Okay, well, two questions follow on from that, if I may. One is, how far up into Australia um, are these effects felt in terms of latitude? And um, and is SAM affected by changes in climate, sort of, the, you know, in terms of the other modelling? Sure. So the, the effect uh, varies a bit by season and by region, but the effect can be quite far north, not obviously not into tropical Australia. It's a sub... Uh, tropical and southern um, temperate zone kind of effect. Um, SAM has been showing a long-term trend towards a more positive phase, affected by both uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also uh, the ozone uh, 
um, depletion of, of the stratosphere in, around Antarctica, but those have had an influence on the kind of average or mean condition of the southern annual mode. Um, and that is uh, projected to continue into the future, affecting um, the average climate and also climate variability of southern Australia especially. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Councillor, you are... Oh, sorry. I was just... You asked about the pyroconvection as well, Councillor? Uh, yes, no, yes, I did, and I was just wondering how that interconnects yes. with Sam. Yes, it's probably mostly for the Bureau to answer because this is the, they're the experts there. But what I would say is that I think um, that pyroconvection um, is more local, associated with the local event, whereas the SAM is having an influence on conditioning the landscape um, in, in the longer term, um, as, as Dr Gross explained. So the, wind, the, the impact of SAM on wind doesn't directly link in to the, um, the pyroconvection events? I, I'll check. I'll, um, check with Dr Gross, my expert, and, and as I said, I think the Bureau would be the ones to really provide that expert. Yes, well, they, they were this morning. I didn't ask them that one because they didn't raise it, so I'm afraid <laughs> so, I'm, so my, I'm stuck with my, you. My, <laughs> my uh, assessment, um, but if you would like, I'm happy to actually follow that up as a, you know, on notice if you'd like, but in here, to, to answer your question, my assessment that that would be less of an effect compared to other things that drive those pirate convection processes. I think there would be other factors that are perhaps more important. That would be my um, my assessment. But as I said, I'd be, we'd be very happy to follow that up. Well, Dr. And, Gross, and Dr. Gross is nodding, so I'm, I'm taking it that, that, that that's a fair summary. In general terms. Yeah. Again, yeah, same with Dr. Clue. I'm not an expert in the area, but that is my sense of the case, I agree with Dr. Clay. Okay, thank you. Very, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank you. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, I have no questions. I'll just say thank you to you both for your presentation today and to the CSIRO for your responses both today and in relation to our notices to give. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Miss Commissioners, there will be an institutional response tendered in due course that CSIRO has provided. Uh, but at this stage, may I ask for Dr Clue and Dr Gross to be excused? Dr Clue, Dr Gross, thank you very much for joining us this, this morning. We appreciate it very much. Uh, you're now excused. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Ms Hogan Doran. Commissioners, the next witness is uh, Lisa Carson from Geoscience Australia, who has a short presentation. In your bundle, you find it behind tab D, uh, 11. It's a PDF version of a PowerPoint presentation that's been prepared by Ms Carson, and there, she will be presenting an animated version of that at the hearing. For the purposes of the tender and for the record, um, the document is GEO. Dot five zero one dot zero zero one dot triple zero one. I also tender a copy of Ms. Carson's curriculum vitae, which I'll take her to in a moment. It's behind tab twelve. That's GEO dot five zero one dot zero zero one dot zero zero four eight. There will also be an institutional response tendered in due course from Geoscience Australia. Those two exhibits it is proposed will be exhibits 1.3.1 .1 and 1.3.2 respectively. Uh, we'll take uh, those exhibits uh, and tenders received as exhibits as you've marked and uh, described. And just confirm the, other, the ones you talked about will be additional exhibits. You added a couple there right at the end. Or did I get that? I, I gave you two. You uh, gave us two, 1.3.1, 1.3.2, and then you said that's that it. They, that's it. Okay. That's it. Oh, also, I was referring, sorry, Chair, I was referring to an institutional response, which has not yet been received from Geoscience Australia, but when it is, we will provide that to okay. the Commission. Thanks. I call Lisa Carson. Hello. Hello, Ms Carson. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Ms Carson, will you take an oath or off affirmation? Affirmation. Ms Carson, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? 
I do. Thank you. Ms Carson, you're the branch head of community safety at Geoscience Australia. Correct. And you represent the Australian Government as a technical advisor on the United Nations Expert Working Group on Disaster Risk Reduction. Have. And that group is to develop indicators to measure global progress in the implementation of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. That working group did um, do that. Uh, you have a Bachelor of Science Honours from the University of Melbourne. Correct. And a Master of Science from the Australian National University. Correct. Uh, you've been with uh, Geoscience Australia for some time, but you have a background also as a geologist and photogeologist. Uh, as a geologist. And you've prepared a presentation uh, which we will give in evidence today to the commissioners. Correct. Right. And you'll indicate to the operator when you want to proceed to the next slide. Yes. And at the end of your uh, presentation, the commissioners may have a few questions. Okay. Thank you, Ms Carson. If operator, if the uh, PowerPoint presentation from Geoscience Australia could be brought up. Thank you, Ms. Carson. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, talk today about the observations and hazard modelling in respect to earthquakes and tsunamis in Australia. So my program has uh, an important contribution to disaster risk reduction activities conducted for multiple hazards. We deliver this trusted information, actionable information, to support informed decision makings for natural hazards across that disaster risk um, management cycle from preparedness, mitigation, response and recovery. And we, do, we have developed an integrated capability to assess risk, which is a combination of hazard, exposure and vulnerability. And we have strong, sustained relationships with all levels of government, um, so we can take our national focus and bear it uh, bring it to bear at that local and regional disaster risk activities. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. It's all right. Thank you. The large earthquakes can happen anywhere in the Australian continent, and Australia experiences about a thousand, sorry, a hundred, that's a lot of, a lot of earthquakes, a thousand, a hundred earthquakes of magnitude three plus per year. The first documented earthquake in Australia occurred shortly after the first fleet arrived in Australia. However, there is Aboriginal uh, dream stories that suggest a longer history of earthquake observations in Australia. And one of the most interesting ones is that uh, they record a dreaming story near Newcastle. Now, Newcastle is one of the most significant, I guess, earthquakes in Australia's history. But you can see clearly on this map some of the, the large earthquakes occurrences. So along the southeast uh, side of Australia there from the southern highlands down to Gippsland. Also in South Australia, the Mount Lofty and Flinders Ranges area. The wheat belt of WA and that north um, northwest area of WA. The earthquake record is more complete in the southern southeastern part of Australia due to the early development of European settlement, and this is where the most complete um, location of our seismic monitoring network is. So the Australian uh, National Seismograph Network has densified over time, um, which has allowed our catalogue to be more complete, and monitoring of the earthquakes have significantly improved since the 1960s which actually, I guess, shows an apparent increase of earthquake, which is more about our recording of earthquakes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a table of significant Australian earthquakes, uh, information from our earthquake catalogue, from newspaper reports, as well as the cost is from the insurance sector. One of the most recent earthquakes uh, that's not listed here is the 2019 uh, magnitude 6.6 .6 off Broome. Um, also listed there is the Newcastle earthquake, which in a couple of slides I'll give some more details, but you will note there it's one of the most costly natural disasters to occur in Australia, and it was only a moderate sized earthquake. Thank you, next slide please. Ms Carson, just so you know, there is a short delay for the slides to come up. 
but the operator can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. This is an example of the Mecarine earthquake. It was a magnitude 6.5 in 1968. There were 20 people injured and luckily no one killed. Um, you can see in the photographs there that was significant damage to infrastructure um, as well as um, you can see houses uh, damaged. There's the most, in most impressive image um, for me is the, the picture there of the uh, railway line. There's also the surface um, feature of the earthquake rupture that's about 37 kilometres and in, in areas is two to three metres high. This um, area is in the, the, the WA wheat belt and is known as the southwest uh, seismic uh, zone. And this one, this rupture, the surface rupture, is one of the largest of three that occurred in, in this region within a 11 year period. Next slide, please. The Newcastle earthquake uh, last year was the 30th anniversary of this earthquake and it's one of Australia's most significant natural disasters. In 1989 December, uh, Newcastle was devastated by a magnitude 5.6, so a local magnitude of 5.6, a moment magnitude of 5.4. The epicentre was 15 kilometres southwest of Newcastle. The earthquake claimed 13 lives. 160 people were hospitalised, 50,000 buildings were damaged, and approximately 40,000 of these were homes. 300 buildings were demolished, 30,000 people were affected, and 1,000 of these were made homeless. It left a bill of approximately $4 billion, and that's uh, normalised dollars to 2017. And just to think, uh, the population at the time of New was for Newcastle was 155,000. Currently, the population for Newcastle is 450,000. Next slide, please. The Geoscience Australia has the full earthquake value train. We monitor, alert, and analyse and alert earthquakes of magnitude 5 plus. We conduct post-disaster surveys for significant events. We feed that data into our earthquake damage models so that we can update risk assessments. And our national scale hazard assessment is used for preparedness. The photos here, the one in the bottom, bottom right-hand corner, is uh, one of our seismic sites. And then the larger photo is our National Earthquake Alert Centre, which also forms part of our joint Australian Tsunami warning system with the Bureau of Meteorology. The map shows our network of seismic stations. So you can see there's the red triangles there, are sites that Geoscience Australia uh, maintain and monitor for actually for nuclear monitoring on behalf of the Australian Government and for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organisation. But that data also feeds into our seismic network. The green is our national seismograph network of uh, seismic monitoring stations. We have approximately 100. The purple is the Joint Urban Monitoring Program, which is a state and federal program of seismic uh, monitoring in larger population centres. And the yellow represents um, seismometers in schools, which is a partnership with ANU, where instruments are run and, monit and monitored by schools. Um, for research on size effects as well as educational awareness. For this network, GA can assure a networking monitoring down to a threshold of a magnitude 3.5. Smaller magnitude earthquakes, earthquakes are, are commonly detected and reported through our website, Geoscience Australia, so at earthquakes at GA. Australia is the most seismically active, stable continental region in the world, having experienced nine of the 15 documented surface rupturing earthquakes from all global stable continental regions. In spite of this activity, the Australian, continent, Australian landmass remains one of the most vastly instrumented continents. For example, the whole Swiss seismological service network of over 100 stations 
would easily fit in the spatial gaps on our network. In addition to this system, we also deploy what we call a rapid deployment kits at short notice to areas affected. These kits allow detailed monitoring of the location and the number of aftershocks to catch a rare, strong ground motion from large aftershocks and improve our understanding of hazard modelling capability. Next slide, please. This slide uh, shows the National Earthquake Alert Centre's products. So in addition to the basic earthquake location and magnitude, GA, Geoscience Australia provides near real-time situational awareness tools to provide actual information for earthquake shaking intensity for emergency managers and first responders. So what you can see here is up on the, the left-hand side is what we refer to as a shake map. And the main image in the middle is the community internet intensity maps. And this is for the 2019 magnitude 6.6 .6 offshore from Broome. So the community internet intensity maps are felt reports submitted online via a questionnaire at the earthquakes at GA webpage. And based on the responses to these questionnaires, a, sh a shaking intensity can be calculated and aggregated to give a grid extent. These maps provide critical ground truthing information on the extent and, sh and degree of shaking in the region. The shake maps combine op observational data with theoretical models, generate near real-time maps of ground motion and shaking intensity during significant earthquakes. For this earthquake, GA received felt reports from over 1,700 individual responses which I think is a pretty impressive in a region that is sparsely populated for this event. They were felt as far away as Darwin and down to Esperance in the south. Next slide, please. Just some background um, on magnitude versus intensity. An earthquake's magnitude is related to the energy released at its epicenter. Magnitude is measured on a logarithmic scale. The intensity of an earthquake refers to the level of ground shaking at any location. The earthquake intensity increases, decreases with the increased distance from, in, from an earthquake. And the, mod the modified Mercalli intensity scale, referred to as the MMI, a simple, simplified version is on the right there, is commonly used to describe the effects of an earthquake at a given place. It is a qualitative assessment of the earthquake effects on people and structures, where the earthquake magnitude is a quantitative measure based on physical recordings made at seismometers. This is an example here is um, a shake map for the Newcastle event, and it shows the shaking intensity. The dots are observations, so there was, um, at the time, people recorded um, on, by hand, on paper, um, their, their experiences of that earthquake and submitted them. So we have now collated all that information and then we've modelled that um, 1989 Newcastle earthquake to provide a, a shake map. And as you can see for Newcastle, it was strong to very strong and on the edge of severe. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our earthquake catalogue in geological time is very short, so we need to look for other information to understand earthquake hazard. Australia has low rates of er erosion relative to the fault relief building, combined with relatively sparse vegetation in much of the country. This allows geologists to identify potential active features that could host large earthquakes in the geological recent past. Geoscience Australia has developed a database of approximately 360 features nationwide that are suspected of being active in the current crustal stress fields, which developed in the last 10 to 5 million years. These features could reasonably host large earthquakes, magnitudes of 7 and larger, again in the future. The reoccurrence time of large earthquakes on any one fault can be determined by trenching. 
So the photo on the bottom right hand side is an example of trenching an entrenching investigation in, of a WA fault scar. The investigation found the last large earthquake on this fault was about 8,000 years ago and the fault could generate an earthquake of a magnitude 6.8 to 7. Only a handful of Australian fault scarps have been trenched. The map up in the right top shows the neotectonic features in southeastern Australia. These neotectonic features are color-coded by fault estimated by the long-term slip rate in, mil in meters per millions of years. And the image you see there is Lake George Fault, one of Australia's most active faults. It is likely that there are many small potentially active faults that are not yet being identified. And of all the historic surface ruptures that have occurred in Australia, have occurred in unanticipated locations, meaning they could not have been identified prior to the event. Next slide, please. The National Seismic Hazard Assessment 2018. This is uh, our hazard assessment and indicating the peak ground acceleration, the 10% probability of being exceeded in 50 years. The map on the, the left shows the neotectonic features, which I was just talking about in the previous slide, and these features have been incorporated into this hazard assessment. The National Hazard Assessment requires a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, and this defines the level of earthquake ground shaking at a given location that has a likelihood of being exceeded in a given period. The method considers, considers all possible earthquakes that have a given likelihood of affecting a given site within the investigation period. And typically, this is the life of a building. One of the fundamental uses of a national scale seismic hazard assessment is, a, is the national building codes and standards. The input and derived products of these assessments are used in a range of infrastructure and community safety applications, informing seismic design and construction of infrastructure and critical post-disaster facilities, for risk mitigation strategies, and also in the insurance sector for their um, insurance and reinsurance premiums for asset um, portfolios. The integration of modern seismic um, hazard models into the National Building Code provides the most effective way to reduce human casualties and economic loss from future earthquakes. Next slide, please. Thank you. Not just a map. I just often we visualise assessments as a single map. Shown here on the top right hand corner is Geoscience Australia's Tropical Cyclone Hazard Assessment, and it's more than just a single map. You can think of a hazard assessment as a stack of maps where each layer in that map relates to a particular average recurrence interval. You may want to understand the maximum wind speed for an average recurrence interval for 100 years hazard for the whole country, or you might be interested in understanding how that wind speed changes with the average recurrence interval at a particular location. And naturally, as the average uh, reoccurrence interval increases, that means the event becomes less frequent and the wind speed increases. So this example here is F Exmouth in WA. You can see if you take a average recurrence interval of 1,000, that its, its potential has a category four to five cyclone, where if you are looking at an average recurrence interval of 50, it is much lower category. There's much more behind these hazard assessments. They are a treasure trove of scenarios. For the tropical cyclone hazard assessment, there are over 160,000 scenarios nationally. And for the earthquake and tsunami, there are millions. These scenarios are what we call synthetic. They represent plausible future scenarios for planning. The scenarios have been generated by sophisticated models using high performance computing and they are available openly. Next slide, please. The 
Returning to earthquakes, another aspect is site response and basin amplification. The ground staking is known as amplification at sites on soft soils and within sedimentary basins. The diagrams here show the seismic waves travelling fast through bedrock into the overlying sedimentary basins and the wave speed slows considerably. Because the energy is conserved, the amplitude of the waves increases to compensate for the slower velocity. So often coastal areas reclaim land along kind of river channels are particularly vulnerable to this ground deformation. And you would have probably seen uh, images of liquefaction where the ground becomes liquid. The map on the right is a section of our 2017 Australian Seismic Site Condition Map for Victoria. The green colours represent harder or firmer rock, where the yellows and orange represents um, the softer soils. Next slide, please. So earthquake risk assessment. So uh, risk assessment, we combine the hazard, exposure, vulnerability to understand the risk of our community to events. This example is from a current project in Perth where stakeholders include the state government and major infrastructure owners. It shows the earthquake risk across Perth, combining, a, combining the damage related to risk and the community resilience. This is a highly um, instructive to decision makers to determine the cost benefit of taking certain approaches to reducing risk. An important point to keep in mind, the risk assessment is done for multiple hazards Then the decision maker is in the position to understand what hazard is driving the risk, and more importantly, what exposed elements is driving the risk. So thinking about the hazard assessment as a stack of maps, for the whole spectrum of average recurrent intervals, we're able to be positioned to assess our risk. A single scenario is not enough to understand risk. We need that full spectrum of average recurrence intervals. Next slide, please. Let's turn to tsunamis. Tsunamis are waves generated when the ocean is disturbed over a broad area in a short period of time. And the graphic there on the left hand side shows um, uh, a tsunami being caused by a earthquake. We have that sudden uplift over and it could be over tens of hundreds of kilometres and this generates a series of waves that propagate along distances. Tsunamis are not only caused by earthquakes but also landslides and volcanic activity that can disturb the ocean and produce those tsunamis. This map shows tsunami sources um, and it's from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration which is database which is the most widely used international database. The lines are the plate tectonic boundaries and most tsunamis are generated by earthquakes near that convergence subduction zone. And Australia, as you can see, is in the mid-plate location, meaning that, that most of the tsunamis that are generated from afar from us. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through some uh, observations of some tsunamis. So last week actually was the 60th anniversary of the Chilean event. Um, the tsunami was uh, you know, typically dangerous close to the source but the waves are highly directional. This means they can be dangerous far, far from the source. And we can see this um, when we show the animation, Hawaii and Japan are impacted. So you'll see um, as the earthquake has generated the tsunami and you can see those waves propagating across the surface and impacting um, Australia, the US, and as far away as Japan. And you can see the wave heights and the deaths there. So far away sites are affected and it depends on the fault location, blip and size. So the 1960 Chilean earthquake was, was not well positioned or well positioned for Australia. Uh, we did not receive very large waves. However, there was um, certainly um, widespread marine damage 
um, boats were damaged, erosion and inundation in Batemans Bay. So moving on to the Sumatran 2004 tsunami, a 9.2 earthquake. This is the Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, 250,000 people were killed. Most of the fatalities were around the Western Indonesian, Sri Lankan, Thailand and India. There were also 300 deaths in Somalia, 5,000 kilometres from the source. And again, you can see that directionality of the waves. In Australia, we, we had widespread, widespread waves up to about one metre in WA. Again, we were lucky the tsunami was not well located to direct large waves to Australia. But we still reported um, some marine hazards. There were 35 ocean rescues, damaged boats and some mild uh, or minor land inundation. Next slide, please. This is a 2006 Java tsunami, a magnitude 7.7. .7. So this was a much smaller earthquake than the previous cases. However, it was well located to affect Australia. You can see the directionality of the waves and the event led to historically high um, run-ups in Australia, 7.9 metres at steep point near Shark Bay in WA. This is a remote area and some people were camping in this region and their beach campsites, as you can see in the photos, were damaged. And there's reports of people in knee-high or chest-high water. They are um, reporting the sound of a roar like a freight train uh, for the first wave that came in. The tsunami heights can vary quite a bit over short distances, so these people were not hit with a 7.9 metre wave. But it highlights the um, importance of the tsunami directionality. Next slide, please. The tsunami hazard modelling, we first look at, uh, is a two-step process. Understanding where the source is, what kind of tsunamis that might be generated and how often. And the second step is to model that inundation. The first step can be conducted over large spatial, spatial scales in the case of earthquakes. And Geoscience Australia's probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment offers a nationally consistent approach. This figure shows the earthquake sources using the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment with a global coverage of major earthquake source zones. For other, for other tsunami sources such as landslide and volcanoes, the science is relatively less well developed and there's no, characteris no characterisation at these scales. And then the second step is that taking that tsunami hazard modelling and undertaking inundation modelling. So this slide just shows where the source zones for Australia's um, probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. Next slide, please. Now, for each of those source zones that you saw on the previous slide, the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment creates a large number of earthquake scenarios, and we model their, their tsunamis. And we also estimate the magnitude and frequency of earthquakes at all those sources. There's a lot of research and testing underlies what's being done. We use data from historical tsunami events to check our models. We use earthquake catalogues and plate tectonic information to model the earthquake frequency. There is normally much uncertainty in the frequency of large earthquakes and tsunami, mainly because they're rare and the relatively length of historical events is very short. Because it is modelled at such a global scale, the models are fairly coarse and do not include inundation. This slide shows the simulation of a tsunami for one possible scenario. The probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment provides one million such scenarios, which then can be forced into inundation models anywhere in Australia. Next slide, please. This figure shows the offshore size of the tsunami with a 500-year average return interval, according to the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. As you can see here on that northwest coast, 
stands out as having high waves. And this is um, because of that east Duda uh, arc. And you'll recall some of those tsunamis, the 2006 earthquake tsunami event. Also on the east coast is prominent, not as much as the, I guess you can say the northwest, but this area in the east is exposed to a large range of Pacific Rim earthquakes. We saw the Chilean um, example in South America, but also closer to home is the Kumadak um, Tonga Ridge, French, which is north of New Zealand. Next slide, please. So the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment is an offshore model. We need to bring that onshore to understand the hazard. We want to know where the areas of potential exposure to that tsunami inundation are, and also understand some of that marine hazards, the unusual currents that will occur in estuaries. This kind of information will guide um, emergency response, as well as design some of those evacuation routes. It's a central input to understand the risk having knowledge of where people and infrastructure are located and how, risk is our, how risky is our current situation. For this purpose, we need to simulate the tsunami near shore and onshore. So these examples here are from Tasmania and southeast Queensland. This kind of modelling requires high resolution elevation data. Coverage of this uh, type of data is advancing rapidly in recent years with a collection of what's referred to as LIDAR information. So it's this remote sensing method to measure and map topography and bathymetry. The um, old data requires still quite a lot of manual processing to clean up and be uh, suitable for doing the modelling. This type of modelling is also uh, very uh, computationally intense and require, and depending on the size and the, the resolution requires um, quite fast computers to help the, the modelling. Currently, Australia is, has limited coverage of tsunami inundation modelling and a lot of the work is on very old, um, poor quality elevation data and this does not take into account the most recent probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. Next slide, please. So in summary, although we're focused on earthquake and tsunami, GAA has a broad capability that underpins and supports the Australian disaster risk reduction activities for multiple hazards in alignment with the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. Our focus is targeted at priority one, understanding disaster risk, hazard, exposure and vulnerability. While earthquakes and tsunamis occur less frequently than other hazards experienced in Australia, their consequences are potentially catastrophic. These hazards suffer due to the short recorded history and lack of complete uh, event catalogues. Comprehensive, open, accessible databases for all hazards make it easier to test and parameterise these models that underpin our understanding of hazards and also provide a ready source of stories to communicate hazards to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Carson. I appreciate that, that brief. Commissioner's question, Commissioner Bennett? Commissioner McIntosh? None for me. No. Thank you. Ms hogan -Doran. Thank you, Ms Carson. Um, you may... Uh, Commissioner, might Ms Carson be excused on her summons? Uh, yes, she can be excused. Thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time to prepare that and, uh, and be able to present it to us today. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Chair, I note the time. If it's convenient to you, the next three witnesses are constituting as a panel. Uh, if that could proceed at 2 p.m., Uh, we can do that at, uh, at 2 p.m. We will have uh, Professor Townsend. No, uh, Professor Townsend, her evidence, she's one of our community witnesses, has been pre-recorded. Uh, rather than it play over the lunch break, it will be, we propose that it would complete the evidence today and go after the three panellists. After the three panellists? Yes. We don't expect the three panellists to take the whole of the afternoon. Okay. In that case, uh, we will adjourn until... What time did you suggest? 2pm. 2pm. We will adjourn until 2pm. Uh, Thank you.
Thank you.
Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Sergeant Doran. Commissioners, this morning you heard evidence from the Bureau of Meteorology, the CSIRO and Geoscience Australia about natural hazards and the influence of climate change. This afternoon you will hear three witnesses who will further explore natural disaster risk in Australia and some of its impacts and consequences. The evidence of these three witnesses will be taken concurrently, that is, in a panel. We're supposed to call each of them and then have the witnesses sworn and then tender their material and then uh, uh, engage with each of them in turn. So I call Mark Laplastria, Ryan Crompton and Sharanjit Padham. Mr Laplastria, Mr Padham, Dr Crompton, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Good to be with you. We could take them in turn. Mr. Lepastri, will you take an oath or an affirmation? That's an affirmation. Thank you. Mr. Lepastri, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence that you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Padham, will you take an oath or affirmation? Affirmation, please. Mr. Padham. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence that you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And Dr Crompton, will you take an oath or affirmation? Uh, affirmation, please. Dr Crompton, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence that you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Laplastria, you have provided a witness statement dated 22 May 2020 under a notice issued by the Commission. Yes. Do you have that witness statement with you? I do. Do you adopt its contents as true and correct? I do. Commissioners, it's proposed that that be that statement, which is doc ID LEP.500.001, dot triple zero one be marked exhibit one point five point one. There are also uh, two reports that have been exhibited to that statement, Mr Lepastria. The first one is a report of SCG economics and planning at what cost mapping where natural perils impact on economic growth and communities from November 2016. Is that correct? That's correct. It's proposed, Commissioner, that that be Exhibit 1.5.2, and that is Doc ID IAG.001.001.0011.0011. And the third document, Mr. Lepastria, is a report called Severe Weather in a Changing Climate, published in November 2019. Propose that that be Exhibit 1.5.3 and Document ID IAG.001.001.0046. So those three documents uh, will be received as exhibits as marked. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Padham, you've provided a witness statement to the Commission dated 21 May 2020. Do you have that with you? I do. And do you adopt its contents as true and correct? I do. Uh, you've also provided um, three additional documents uh, from the Actuaries Institute. Those will be identified as proposed commissioner as... Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I apologise, I've missed. Exhibit 1.6.1 will be that witness statement. Exhibit 1.6.2, 1.6.3 and 1.6.4 will be as follows. The Actuaries, Australian Actuaries Institute Climate Index, November 2018. Doc ID SHP.501.001.0001.0001. The next being 
the Actuaries Climate Index Some Comments on Extremes, published December 2018, DOC ID SHP.501.001.0019. And the third, I'll just ask Mr. Padham some questions about that. Mr. Padham, you provided yesterday uh, a number of documents. Could I have that document shown on the screen? It is SHP.502.001.0019. And are these uh, three pages that you have provided, which are recent, perhaps if you could describe them in short, they from taken from that website link on, contained on that page and are the most current composite and individual component indexes indices from the Australian Actuaries Climate Index. Is that correct, Mr Padham? That's right. Thank and they also contain the North American Climate Index, the latest edition of that. Thank you, Mr Padham. And that will constitute Exhibit 1.6.4, Commissioner. Thank you. So we'll take those four documents uh, as exhibits as marked. And the final matter of housekeeping, Dr Crompton, you provided a report dated 22 May 2020 under notice issued by the Commission. That's correct. Do you have that with you? Uh, yes, I do. You have a number of corrections you wanted to make to that report. If we could just have those marked to the record, as, and please tell me if this is correct. On page 9, line 24, you refer to a 110-year record, and your correction, as I understand it, is that it should say a 121-year record. Is that correct? That's correct. The second correction is a correction to figure four. Figure four specifies death rates per 100,000 population from bushfires in Australia for the financial years 1899-1900 to 2019-2020. I understand there's a correction you wish to make uh, to insert into that. Would you be able to identify that correction for the benefit of the transcript? It's just for clarity that 1899-1900 refers to the year 1900, which is uh, not consistent with the previous figures. So it's for clarity. Am I to understand it that it's not the financial year but the calendar year 1900 is what you're referring to? No, no, it's just that the, eight, the year beginning 1 July 1899 in that figure refers to 1900 on the, uh, on the figure itself. And then you also have a correction uh, to page 7, table 1, the breakdown of normalised Australian insurance losses by peril based. 1966 to 2017, and I understand the word based should be deleted from that heading, is that correct? That's right. That's correct. So subject to those amendments and corrections, is the content of um, your report true and correct? Yes, that's correct, yes. Okay, so with those amendments, that document will be received as an exhibit as marked one Point seven point one. That's right. Thank you, Commissioner. Just excuse me one moment, gentlemen. Mr. Lepastri, if we may commence with you. You're the executive manager of the Natural Perils Team at IAG Limited, is that correct? And you have a bachelor's degree with first class honours in atmospheric science from Macquarie University. Correct. And you've been a leader of the of IAG, if I may call Insurance Australia Group, that by its um, acronym IAG's Natural Perils Team since around 2005. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, I understand you know each of uh, Mr. Padma and Mr. Crompton. Uh, I note you're a member of the Advisory Board of Risk Frontiers, which is Dr Crompton's uh, uh, 
organisation and you've been a member of that advisory board since 2008? Yes. Uh, and you also um, and you also know Dr Padham in relation to work with the Insurance Council of Australia, is that correct? Uh, the Climate Measurement Standards Initiative. Thank you. Now, we've heard this morning in evidence of natural hazards. What's the difference, if anything, between natural hazards and natural perils, noting that IAG has a natural perils team? Could you explain that difference to the commissioners just as before we get underway? It's one and the same. In natural hazards is the term typically used outside of the insurance industry, uh, but natural perils is often used within the insurance in industry, but we principally mean the same same thing. And I IAG natural perils team, who, what is it? What constitutes it, or who works within that team? Who works with with you, Mr. Lepastria? Yeah, so I have a team of. Um, more grounded in uh, natural hazards than you would typically see in a normal uh, insurance um, analytical team. So we have meteorologists, um, engineers, uh, statisticians um, in the team. Do you also have atmospheric scientists and hydrologists and mathematicians? Yes. That's correct. And, and what's the role or purpose of that team? The team is, looks at the natural peril risk um, for an insurance company, and that's across both the reinsurance requirements, so when large single events might impact a large population, it's, it's understanding those very large losses and what sort of reinsurance provisions we may need. The other part of it is understanding the pricing perspective, so how much of the natural peril risk needs to be factored into insurance policies. Another aspect of it, of our, what our team does, is provides uh, some of those alerts and forecasts for our claims areas um, for upcoming impacts, so they can better respond. And we also get involved in uh, estimating losses uh, in the early days after large natural catastrophe. Uh in, uh, in the period leading up to November 2019, IAG partnered with uh, the National Centre for Atmospheric Research, which is based in the United States, for the preparation of a report, uh, which is the um, which you've exhibited to your statement, severe weather in a changing climate. Um, what, what's the purpose of that report? And if we might have it called up now, it is doc ID IAG.001.001.0046. Okay, the, the report um, is part of an ongoing uh, program of work looking at the impact of climate change on uh, severe weather um, types, things like tropical cyclones, bushfires, east coast lows, floods, and hail events. Uh, they're the sort of events that cause damage to property and IAG is a large property insurer. So we need to understand how those uh, types of severe weather are changing under a changing climate, what has happened to date and what's happening in the future. The actual report to be released in 2019 was based on a particular piece of work which occurred mostly through around 2017 where we're trying to provide a more formal, I suppose, framework of how we look at future climate change scenarios are using kind of more standard kind of reference um, uh, carbon emission trajectories. So what we realised through that report, so the first part of it was to try and understand how the risk, the property risk that we insure, how that may change with severe weather under these future climate scenarios and we used uh, you know, plus two, plus three degree global mean temperature scenarios as the main basis. Um, and to try and estimate how, what does that mean to a property risk perspective? What do these future scenarios look like? And to give us an idea of where we're heading into and what may be the things we needed to consider today. So um, what we re realised through that piece of work was that um, there's an enormous amount of activity right now in disclosing climate-related financial risks for the finance industry in particular. And we realised that first step of trying to understand the global thinking on climate change science is going to be repeated 
by many, many stakeholders. So we thought this is an opportunity to release our work, to act as a base for others to build on, and hopefully we can collectively move forward um, establishing more um, centralised and accurate um, sources of information. So, Mr Lepastria, you, um, IAG partnered with um, NCAR, if I may refer to that. How long has that collaboration been going on and why did you uh, approach NCAR, the National Centre for Atmospheric Research, it being in, based in the US, not in Australia? Yeah, so we, our collaboration started around 2012-2013, although we've some of the authors um, of the report who are part of NCAR, we've, um, they've been in the risk assessment, climate risk assessment world for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> that particular, we partnered with NCAR um, mainly because they're one of the leading institutions worldwide into looking at how severe weather may change with climate change. The US uh, has a, a population you know, ten, more than 10 times Australia and that population is exposed to the same kind of hazards that we have here in Australia. So it's not surprising some of the better, um, the best institutions in the world are housed there. Now, if we could go to um, I'll take you to the key assessments made of the set out in the executive summary of the report. If we could go operator to page 49 or dot zero zero four nine. And if I could have you just focus on key assessments are and down from there, the page. Just in summary, um, Mr Lepastri, could you speak to what the key insights or key findings were of this work in collaboration with NCAR and as published in this report in respect of tropical cyclones in particular in the Australian region? Okay. Did you want me to focus on the other severe weather as well? I'm going to come to each of those in turn. Okay. So tropical cyclones, um, now our focus is on the more severe end of tropical cyclones, so the more severe category fours and fives in particular, because they cause the most risk. And our, our assessment is that while tropical cyclones may decline in numbers overall for our region, we believe the more intense cyclones will become uh, more frequent. Um, there's also a, we believe, a, a broadening of the areas affected by cyclones, so a, a bit of a southward and a pole expansion, um, meaning that places that are on the, the fringe of cyclone activity, like the southeast Queensland, northeast New South Wales area, are going to um, increasingly be exposed to cyclones going forward. Uh, while they're not a, a high risk area at the moment, we, we believe that's one of the um, faster changing areas, similarly for southwest um, Western Australia. So, just to speak to that, if we could go to figure nine on page 66. Operator. And just zoom in on figure nine. Figure 9 summarises the expected regional changes to the frequency of all tropical cyclones, low intensity cyclones, which Australian categories 1 and 2, and intense tropical cyclones, Australian categories 3, 4 and 5. Does that summarise what you were just identifying to the Commissioners? Uh, yes, but there's a couple other points that I could Please. probably need to point out from that slide. So typically from the scientific literature, you will have information for the Australian region. Uh, so typically you would have information in the Southwest Pacific. And if I highlight that um, box out to the um, east of the Queensland coast, um, where it's showing a, a slight decline in uh, cyclones overall, mostly coming from the weaker cyclones, possibly not a lot of change with the stronger ones. That's the kind of statistic that you will get from the typical scientific, scientific literature of how cyclones are likely to affect and um, likely to change with further climate change uh, in the Australian region. What we've done with this particular slide, though, is to, to interpret from that basin-wide information, how do we think the changes in cyclones, um, what are the characteristics will change when you actually get to the different coastlines? 
So what we're trying to demonstrate here is we believe there's going to be quite different impacts around the coastlines of Australia. We believe that there might be a, um, a slight reduction perhaps in the frequency of the cyclones in the far north, um, more frequent intense ones through the middle of, say, Queensland, um, but a faster changing uh, risk as you move southwards. So it's really pointing out that um, you could have quite disproportionate impacts around the country and to plan for that is, is important. And could we also then go to page 69, operator, and I'll have you look at figure 10, zoom in on figure 10. Figure 10 tracks the 10 most significant tropical cyclones to have affected the southeast Queensland and northeast New South Wales region since 1954. The horizontal dashed lines show the mean latitude of maximum intensity for this set of tropical cyclones at 21.5 degrees south and the latitude of Brisbane at 27.0 degrees south. Mr Lepastro, I might just have you again or perhaps assist the commissioners by the distinction but I understand you to be drawing between tropical cyclones taking place or taking, um, having activity over deep water but then coming to the coast and where they interact with the coast by reference to the Australia's population centres, particularly in South East Queensland and North and New South Wales. Yes, can I clarify the question? Did you like me to describe what we're trying to demonstrate by that figure? Indeed. Yes, so we're trying to help the reader understand how we've taken the basin-wide statistic of the Southwest Pacific to make it relevant for changes on the coastline in, say, the southeast Queensland, northeast New South Wales area. So those tracks, basically, what happens in that area is that those cyclones typically form well to the north and they reach maximum intensity well to the north of that area and as they travel in that southwest direction towards the coast, they typically uh, decay or decline in intensity. What we expect in a warmer world in some of these future uh, climate change scenarios is that the intensity is likely to um, occur slightly further south and those cyclones will most likely decay less because the heat content of the ocean will allow them to maintain their intensity further south. So you can end up with a very different change in statistics of cyclones um, in that, you know, those southern areas of um, cyclone activity now that compared to what the basin-wide statistic might look like. So you spoke then about the southern movement or the poleward movement in the scenario for future tropical cyclone activity. Uh, if I could have you look now at figure 17 on page 82, which is now looking at the question of severe thunderstorms and in particular the hail component. So just to recap for the benefit of the commissioners, the report captures, or the report addresses a number of severe weather events. Uh, one we've just touched upon, tropical cyclones, also um, uh, increasing in flooding and now uh, um, hailstorm events. This schematic graph on page 82, figure 17, shows the relative change in large and giant hailstorm frequency between the 1950s and then a climate change scenario um, at the extreme of plus three degrees. What, what is thought to be portrayed or explained by this, um, this figure, Mr Lepastria? Okay, so this is another area um, where you won't find this detail in published literature, typically. So again, we're focused on severe hail that causes damage. We, we, we're looking at the large and giant hail uh, spectra, not any hail. So we've concentrated on the stuff that, that damages property, damages um, car panels, damages uh, roofing. So what we again show that, that we will, there's quite, um, regional variation how we expect the hail climate to change. We believe typically there's a shift southwards um, and there's a there's a shift towards the more extreme end of hailstorms. So we think there's going to be a, a higher frequency of the more severe, the giant hail that's represented here. Now what 
What I should emphasize in this slide, as well as the previous slide on cyclones, is this is our best interpretation of how we think the risk will change. And we've encouraged, we're encouraging feedback from the scientific community to challenge us on this and, and also to help, or I suppose it's to emphasize where we believe more research needs to be done to firm up this, this evidence. But this is where we think using the information that's available in the literature and our best scientific interpretation, our understanding of the physical environment of how we think things will play out. And I understand that there is ongoing work and a proposed further issue of this report uh, sometime perhaps this year or early next year. Is that right, Mr Lepastria? That's right. We're, we're working on a, about a July timeframe to um, update the report, uh, typically because a lot of the work was done previously to 2017 and there's been some very uh, worthwhile scientific studies that have happened since that point. And I might take you then to um, this. In the executive summary, you also addressed uh, the phenomenon of the and the impacts of the East Coast lows. But if we might pass over that and consider bushfire risk assessment, the uh, witness could be shown page 50 of the of the report operator, and paragraph five. And one of the key assessments you set out in this report that were set out by you and the co-authors in the report is that bushfire risk, as measured by the trends in fire danger indices, is likely to increase in almost all locations nationally, leading to more frequent and extreme events and longer fire seasons. The rate of increase varies by location and will depend on weather system changes and site-specific factors at regional levels. And what I wanted to do is to take you to um, then to page 91 of your report. Now, as I and, and to the uh, passages under the heading regional interpretations for risk assessment for Australia. Now, as I understand it, is this correct, um, Mr. Lepastria? This report was, as you said, um, most of the work was done in about 2017 and the references that are here uh, in this passage is, are primarily from 2016 and as I understand it, the work that is being done will be further updating, in particular, your bushfire risk assessment for Australia. Um, one of the propositions that you adopt in this passage is that bushfire is one of the fastest growing climate risks facing Australia but that there's limited information in the literature about trends in the extreme and catastrophic bushfires that typically drive most of the property bushfire risk. Um, what, difficult, what problems have you seen in terms of information, in terms of being able to make assessments uh, of risk in relation to bushfires in Australia? Okay, so bushfire, the, the indices that we were relying on in this report are quite simplistic. So this is the, typically the MacArthur Forest Fire Danger Indice, and there are better indices or indices that uh, supplement this, such as the Haynes or C. Haynes Index, which would be part of the updated report, and that actually helps provide a bit more information on when atmospheric instability actually increases um, or might be a better measure of the fire risk behaviour from an atmospheric perspective. Um, that might be better than FFDI in some circumstances. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of it, but there's a whole lot of other things. This is just the fire weather. You've still got the ignition sources, <clears throat> the vegetation response and, and things like that. So there's, um, it's, it's quite a complex um, area to understand all of the uh, different um, things at play. Thank you, Mr Lepastria. I might just pause with you for a moment now and go to Dr Com Compton. Dr Compton, in your report, and if the operator will um, bring up ryc.500.001.0001, Dr. 
Dr Crompton, this report that you have uh, prepared for the Royal Commission, which was based on a submission that you provided through the public submission process, uh, has um, more recent incorporates more recent survey, damage surveys that have been undertaken by Risk Frontiers. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure it incorporates any more recent uh, damage surveys than what was in the, the uh, original submission. I apologise. I mean, um, in from the period of uh, uh, the IAG severe weather report compared to your report. Yeah, so there's a couple of damage surveys undertaken from Black Summer, that's correct. All right then. If we could go to page four of that. The first thing I want to ask you some questions about, Mr. L Mr. Dr Crompton, is the burnt area surveys that you have done of the areas that was burnt during the most recent bushfires, in particularly in New South Wales and Victoria. If we could just focus in on the first paragraph and then we'll go to the graphs. Thank you, operator. In this paragraph, uh, I'll just state it for the benefit of the record and then I want to ask you a couple of questions about it. You note that in terms of the total bushland area burnt in New South Wales and Victoria, the 2019-2020 year to date is already the largest since data based on satellite imagery first became available to measure this in November 2000. What is the satellite imagery, just, a, just as a preliminary question, what is the satellite imagery that you're um, referring to in, an, in your report there? So the satellite imagery is a publicly available data set. So uh, it's a data set which is called the uh, MODIS Burnt Area Product, which is from NASA. So the data itself is available since November 2000. Uh, it contains burnt pixels globally uh, on a daily basis at 500 metres resolution. So it's a satellite derived data set. All right. Uh, and could the witness now be shown figure one, both um, both A and B, and the notation at the bottom? And Dr Compton, could you explain what these figures show to the commissioners? Sure. So the figure shows the total bushland area burned uh, in New South Wales, which is in the top section, and Victoria. Uh, in the bottom se section, which is based on that satellite derived data, uh, the MODIS burn area product. So we take that data and we aggregate it for 12 month, 12 month periods beginning July 1. We also select only those pixels that intersect the bushland areas and we use a land covered Australia to do that. So due to the lag in data availability, the current 2009 season is based on data up to February 2020. So the total bush, the total bushland area burn in New South Wales and Victoria for that 2019-20 black summer period uh, year to date is the largest over the last 19 season. And this is particularly so in New South Wales, as you can see in the top figure, where the area that was burnt was more than three times larger than any other season. And what are the position compared to Victoria for Victoria compared to previous seasons, Dr. Crompton? Yes, yeah, so Victoria is also the largest, uh, but it's comparable to uh, some of the earlier seasons. And I will uh, just note that I, there are other longer-term data sets that are available, but this publicly available satellite data set only goes back to November 2000. All right. Well, I'll take you next to the next portion of your report, which addresses. Black Summer's building damage and insured loss. Now that's only insured losses, not economic impact more broadly uh, or uninsured losses. We go to page five of your report and this second and third paragraphs and have those um, blown up. And then I'm gonna take uh, the commissioners to the normalized uh, figure on the next page. And what's the effect of your um, understanding from your analysis Dr. Crompton, in relation to the comparable damage, bushfire building damage from the Black Summer compared to previous seasons? Yes, so in normalised terms and looking at it from an Australian perspective, uh, the loss from Black Saturday is comparable uh, to, to other seasons. Um, it may become the most damaging since 1925. Uh, 
Black Summer estimate to date, the damage to date, is, is a lower bound as it only includes destroyed houses and not other types of buildings. So I think it's also mentioning the underlying data set, Risk Frontiers uh, maintains uh, called Perilors. So it's a database of natural hazard building damage and fatalities uh, in Australia, and it's derived from newspaper archives and other official documents as well. So it's been used in a lot of publications. It's been used in a lot of studies for emergency services across Australia. So the records that are available are since 1900 inside of that database. There are some earlier records, but in terms of bushfire, it's most reliable since 1925. So, uh, Council, were you going to show the figure? Shall I stop there? Or Yes, I am. So just before, okay. before we do that, your figures for, may we take it from what you've said, that although you've had all this um, additional archive and material for Yep. years prior to the 2019-22 season, the 2020-2020 season analysis is based is not as in, based on as complete a record as the earlier seasons. Is that correct? That's right. So everything up until the current Black Summer 2019-20 uh, season, uh, there has been effort to capture building damage from different building types, not only houses. Whereas in that 2019-20 year, that is using the number of destroyed houses only. And that data is taken directly from uh, AFAC, uh, and the estimate is 3,094 houses. And when you refer to AFAC, that acronym stands for? Uh, the Australasian and Fire uh, Authorities Council, uh, if I'm, uh, I am, I'm pretty sure. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner will be hearing from them. Commissioners will be hearing from them uh, next week. Uh, so, Dr. Compton, just before I pass from um, uh, to the next figure in the second paragraph on the page, uh, you make the point that um, there's a there's a differential in the damage that has been experienced between New South Wales and Victoria when compared with earlier seasons. Yeah, that's right. So, if we were to, with about uh, showing the the actual figure itself. Uh, we were to do plot the same figure as, as what I think you're about to show for New South Wales, uh, then New South Wales, the damage in terms of the 2019-20 season uh, would be by far the most damaging season, uh, with current estimates about 2.5 times as large as any other season. All right. Well, if you just go to figure two, which I think is the one you're speaking of, but I think this is for all of Australia, that's on page yeah, that's right. six. Uh, so this is a figure for normalised bushfire building damage in Australia since 1925. I'll just pause before I ask you to say too much about it and just explain for the commissioners and confirm the record what you mean by normalised. So when, when we normalise a loss, uh, that means that what we're seeking to do is to estimate the impacts of past events on present society. Depending on what type of data you are normalising, the normalisation process uh, can, be, can be slightly different. So in this case, the metric that we, the building damage uh, is recorded inside of Perilors is called a house equivalent. So that is essentially taking damage to the built environment, it might include commercial and industrial buildings as well as, as, well as houses, and converting that using floor areas and relative building costs to an, equi to an equivalent number of houses destroyed. So when we normalise house equivalents, we adjust for the change in the number of dwellings over time. Okay. And so how would you correlate the loss in terms of destroyed buildings uh, with the area of burnt bushland? So we, you've, you've recorded the bushfire building damage in this figure and the earlier figure that I took you to was the bushland burned area in New South Wales and Victoria. What kind of correlation is there between those two variables? Yeah, the, the correlation is, is not very strong at all. So in New South Wales, in Black Summer, it's a very good example where you have a season where you have a very large burn area uh, that corresponds to a very large uh, number of uh, d damage to the built environment. Whereas there are plenty of other examples through time where that correlation uh, doesn't exist. So Black Saturday is a good example where you had extreme impacts, but not a you know an otherwise reasonably unremarkable 
uh, burnt, burnt area. And the same with Victoria for black summer, uh, in that the burnt area is the largest over the last 19 years, but the damage in Victoria over black summer uh, was not large compared, compared to other lost years. And, and is that because the exposure of populations depends on, to the extent of the exposure to fire and bushfire, depends on the vulnerability of that population, that is its, its, its proximity to the ongoing fire front? Is that an aspect of consideration? Yeah, uh, I, can, I just confirm that you can hear me. I just had a bit of trouble with sound then. Can you hear me still, Council? Yes, I can. Did you hear the question, Dr Crompton, or do you require me to re repeat it? Uh, no, I, I think I did. So the, the random nature uh, that exists in the episodic nature of the extremes that, he, that I prevail in Figure 2 is due to the distribution of exposure. So throughout Australia in particular, the population is inhomogeneously distributed. So the time series of damage that exists in that figure two is very much a function of whether a fire has impacted a populated area and how big that populated area is that has been impacted. Could you explain this next to us, figure three on the next page, page eight, which is the cumulative distribution of buildings destroyed, this time in relation to the distance from nearby bushland for recent major events. What does, that sure. what does this tell us about the proximity to bushland as a risk factor in these different locations? And in particular, when one looks at this, um, this graph, we understand that the purple line, which is near the centre, is the New South Wales south coast, which are from the most recent bushfire season. These figures taken have just had the pointer by the operator, uh, is taken from December 2019 uh, damage surveys by Risk Frontiers. Yeah. So we undertake damage surveys after all ma major natural disasters in, in Australia and bushfires are no different. So the, the two curves that have been added through the experience of Black Saturday, uh, sorry, of Black Summer, are the New South Wales South Coast curve in purple, as you mentioned, and the yellow uh, curve, uh, which is for, for Ratville. So what our research has shown over a number of fires, and this is a number of fires since the year 2000, is that distance to bushland is demonstrably the most important variable that determines uh, building vulnerability to bushfire. So if you take the New South Wales South Coast curve in purple, on the x-axis of this curve, we have the percentile of all destroyed buildings, and on the y, we have the distance from the adjacent bushland. So where that purple curve intersects the x-axis, the horizontal axis, that's at a level of 38%. So if we read across then to the left-hand side, to the y-axis of the curve, we see that that distance from adjacent, adjacent bushland is one metre. So what that is telling us is 30%, 38% of the homes destroyed and that we surveyed in that New South Wales South Coast fire were within one metre of bushland. So there was almost no separation whatsoever. If we follow that New South Wales South Coast curve in purple back to the 80th percentile, we can see that 80% of the destroyed structures were within 100 metres of bushland. And where all of the curves across the different fires are starting to converge, converge in the top right-hand corner is at roughly 1,000 metres, which is the largest distance generally that we've observed damage. Noting that in the New South Wales South Coast fires, we also observed some buildings being destroyed at around 1.3 kilometres. The other feature of this figure that is evident in the Duffy curve, and that is for the Canberra 2003 bushfires and the Ratville curve in yellow, is the effect of embers. So if you look at where the Duffy curve is hitting the y-axis, the vertical axis of the curve, that is at around the 40 metre mark. 
So there were actually no buildings that were destroyed in Duffy until you hit that 40 metre mark. So that really illustrates the ability of embers to penetrate the built environment and a similar situation was observed with the Ratville fire. And both of these fires uh, occurred under very strong winds. So the other point finally just to make on the curve is that our evidence also too that we collected after Black Saturday was uh, focused on King Lake and Marysville. And you can see that where those two curves, the one in black and red hit the x-axis is at 25%. So in those fires, you had 25% of the, of the destroyed structures uh, within one metre of bushland. So when you have a combination of buildings that are built very close to bushland, you have extreme fire weather conditions, and then you have a fire in those uh, buildings, then they don't stand generally very Dr. Chomton, just I'll just tell so you. Definitely, to... the research highlights the importance. Dr. Compton, I'll just have you just pause for a moment because we're getting some breaking in your uh, transmission. I'll just get some um, an update on whether or not that's from our end or your end. His end. All right. Dr. Compton, I'm, I'm I'm informed it's coming uh, not from you. It's coming from your end, or at least the transmission into. Uh, our our systems. Had you completed what you wish to say in relation to Figure Three? Uh, I was just going to add that the research does highlight the importance of land use planning in bushfire prone locations. All right, thanks very much. Now, just one last matter I want to take you to on the next page. You also um, maintain in your database uh, a, a record of fatalities and you've made a preliminary assessment in relation to um, comparable, uh, comparable fatalities uh, in the period since uh, in the last decade. Um, you note that uh, you record 65 deaths due to bushfires since 2009 to most recently, and you've made some observations that in a summary way, and I'll have, you, um, have the operator bring that up for the commissioners from about line 15 with the comparing the with the paragraph commencing while a lot more detail is available from the database on causes of death and activities at the time of death, you have noted the disproportionately high rates of deaths amongst a number of people. And if you could just um, identify those as those coming from your, um, your analysis of your fatality database, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. So again, just noting the dis disproportionately high rates amongst professional volunteer firefighters, males aged 60 and over trying to save their own property with pre-existing health conditions, uh, males aged 55 attempting late evacuation, and males and females aged 55 in their house. Yes, that's right. All right. Thank you. One of the other things that is done um, in your report is to see not ju not just the um, not to only look at the uh, experience of bushfires and in particular the bushfires in the 2019-20 season, but to also compare those fatalities as against other natural disasters uh, in Australia. And if I could have the commissioners take into the next page, page 10, um, to in a sense uh, explain the ranking, if it, if I could use that term. Um, for comparable numbers of fatalities between 1900 and 2015, broken down by peril category. Uh, just highlighting on that table too, what is the um, most deadly natural hazard in Australia based on that um, historic data? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. So from our analysis of the fatalities over that period, 1900 to 2015, uh, which is taken from the, the Parallels database and just pointing out that this is the recorded number of fatalities and has not been normalised uh, in any way, uh, is that the heat waves are clearly Australia's natural, uh, deadly, deadliest natural hazard. And they account for almost half of the total number and almost five times the number uh, of fatalities uh, than do bushfires. So a relevant statistic uh, to this for the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires that reflects the importance of heat waves and this comes from the Victorian Department of Health and 
uh, was it that there were 374 excess deaths in, Vic in Victoria due to the heat wave that pre preceded Black Saturday? And that compares to the 173 fatalities that were due to the bushfires themselves. And Dr. Brugans uh, earlier this morning alluded to uh, a similar figure, but including in Victoria, but also outside. And um, one of the other matters that you have done is to identify locations based on the experience historically of national, sorry, I'll withdraw that, natural hazards becoming natural disasters because of the coincidence of exposure and vulnerable populations. Uh, you've undertaken analysis of ranking of annual loss, including damages from different natural hazards and identified them by postcode, that is where people live. If we could go to table three, which is on page 12, and it's the last matter I want to take you to, Dr Compton. Sure. And what do we see here? Yeah, so the purpose of this, this table uh, is to demonstrate that it's possible to identify what areas of Australia pose the greatest risk of financial loss to insurable assets such as residential, commercial and industrial property. So we've done this using our suite of probabilistic catastrophe loss models, uh, which are for flood, bushfire, hail, tropical cyclone and earthquake. So we've calculated the average annual loss for each Australian postcode based on exposure information, which is derived from Geoscience Australia's National Exposure Information System, or Nexus for short, uh, their Nexus database. So this shows the top 20 postcodes nationwide, and the results are also uh, illustrated in a figure in my statement as well. So Bundaberg is right with the highest AAL relative to all other postcodes. All the highest rated postcodes, as you can see from this table, are in Western Australia, Queensland or New South Wales, with either flood or tropical cyclone being the most significant perils uh, within each. So this information about relative natural disaster risks is useful in determining national uh, mitigation investment priorities. So the rankings can vary according to the loss metric that is used or geographic boundaries if we use something else other than a postcode. And the final uh, point is that the postcodes, using those as, or using a postcode ignores the potential uh, losses attributable to wider scenarios. So for an example, uh, as an example, the potential losses due to flooding are greater than just the postcode of Windsor and the catastrophe loss models are under, are able to analyse those types of scenarios as well. All right. Thank you very much, Dr Crompton. We may return to you. I might now turn to, Doc, to Mr Padham. Over. Oh yes, sorry, I'm reminded. Uh, Mr Lepastria, one connection to what Mr Dr Crompton has just said in terms of the financial financial impact of, um, of natural disasters. And next to your statement was um, an earlier report in which IAG had a role in its preparation. That is IAG.001.001.0011. This is all that's being brought up. What was this? This, for the benefit of the transcript, is, as I understand it, um, Mr Lepastria, a joint report by IAG and SGS Economics and Planning published in November 2016, at what cost, question mark, mapping where natural perils impact on economic growth and communities. What was the, the genesis of this report and the purpose of this report? Yeah, so this, this report supplies that, um, I suppose, an extra perspective of what you need to, go, to consider when you're planning for natural disasters. So we, this report focuses on economic activity, where it actually resides and where it intersects with natural hazard exposure. So it's a, an extension to say how an insurer would look at risk and just look at the um, annual 
loss perspective at a particular street address for that business or for that home. And this is really looking at the economic activity of an area and um, that should be considered as part of your um, land planning and, and uh, disaster planning. And could I get the operator to go to page 16 and to the second column uh, just near the top? You have, as if you could zoom into the sentence, LGAs, that's, I take it, is local government areas. Local government areas with high and extreme risk of bushfire generated 175 billion or 10.8 per cent of GDP and are home to 2.2 million people, that is 9.2 per cent of the population. What were you seeking to convey by that part of the executive summary, Mr Lepastria? Okay, so I am, I was only part of, my team was only part of some of the input to this report. Yes. Um, but I can, I can help um, what I believe that, that paragraph I say. <clears throat> so a local government area um, is quite large. And so um, what they're saying is that the local government areas that intersect with um, bushfire risk um, uh, generates, you know, about 10.8% of GDP. And, you know, you've got about 2. Point million people living there. It's not to say that every risk address in that LGA is exposed there, but it does focus on there's a lot of local government areas with high bushfire risk and significant um, productivity from an economic perspective. And, and, and may we take it that whereas what the um, earlier observations of Dr Crompton was, which was to focus on the normalised losses from property damage and then uh, identifying the economic impact is not just the economic impact or the risk of economic impact is not limited to property damage but to the activity and the economic activity in the area. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Now, um, if I just pause from that and now go to um, Mr Padham. Mr Padham, no. The Actuaries Institute, you know, which you're a fellow of and have been for some time, um, some may ask, and perhaps you can assist, what is the role of an actuary? Um, so, so generally speaking, actuaries are uh, involved in the assessment of risk, uh, in the quantitative assessment of risk. Um, we, we are practitioners and work with industry, government, and a range of stakeholders uh, in the analysis of risk um, broadly. Um, for insurance companies, um, we are involved in a range of functions, some of which are mandated by, the, by legislation and by the regulator. Um, primarily, we're looking at uh, the financial uh, sustainability of the insurance company um, so that uh, the insurance company is able to pay claims in the future. Uh, we look at a range of issues. Uh, so one example is we may work with teams like, uh, actuaries may work in teams like Mark's team and, and, and provide advice, uh, be advised by Ryan, sorry, Mr. Lepastia's team and Dr. Crompton's team um, that provide us advice on what the uh, impacts of these natural disasters are. We would then incorporate that within pricing of insurance contracts uh, looking at the adequacy of pricing of contracts. Uh, we would also look at the, the valuation of insurance liabilities, uh, what money the insurance company has to put aside to pay claims on events that have happened. Uh, we would look at the capital requirements for the insurance company, um, as well as uh, the financial reporting um, of all of this information. Now, um, you've been a fellow, you've been a, an actuary since, uh, the, uh, since 1994 and a fellow since 2000. Uh, you're um, a fellow of the Institute of Actuaries Australia. The Institute has, has um, undertake or undertook a project in 2018 to create what's known as the Australian Actuaries Climate Index. Um, what is that index and, and how, is it, how is it going to assist or is it intended to assist um, actuaries, the public and policy makers, in addition to the companies that you ordinarily would have an actuary advise? Yes, so uh, we created the index to look at uh, trends in extreme weather across Australia 
uh, to help uh, policymakers, um, actuaries, and companies and the general public about the impact of such events in Australia. Um, we specifically wanted to look at extreme events, so we've looked at extreme data within uh, extreme events or um, the, uh, within the data and created an index to show how that might is changing over time. So you, you focus on extreme events, but why focus on extreme and the extreme of extreme events? What's, what's the relevance to that analysis, of that analysis? So what we find is that it is the extreme events that um, provide, uh, that damage um, a range of things that uh, actually negatively impact. So insurance claims, for one example, are driven by extreme events. Uh, they're not driven by average weather from day to day. They're driven by the occurrence and frequency and severity of extreme events. Um, we've also seen, uh, as Dr. Crumpton has shown, um, human lives and the loss of life are also driven by extreme events. Um, and there are a number of economic factors that are driven by the extreme events. So generally in Australia, we, you know, we build uh, buildings and we have systems that are designed that have thresholds so that they're designed to survive under most types, most ranges of events. Um, but at the extreme events, they fail. So buildings fall down, uh, fires start. Uh, and so it's the extreme events that drive um, the losses that we may experience on a financial level, on an economic level, on a social level, and an environmental level. I see. Mr. Lepastri, would you wish to comment on that and the focus on ex the extreme of extremes? Uh, no, I agree with um, Sharon. It's it's the extreme end that's really the um, the part that's unusual, the part that's um, often beyond our design codes and, and land planning that's driving the bulk of the risk. All right. Mrs. that might be a point for me to stop and um, invite any questions from you. Thank you. We do have a few questions. I'll start with uh, <laughs> Commissioner Bennett first. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've just got a few questions, maybe some of these that I simply didn't um, quite understand, or I want to clarify a couple of things that you said um, during the course of your evidence and the description of your reports. Perhaps I'll start with Mr Lepastria because I've got my note on that one first. You did the, uh, the combined study with the United States people and you were saying that there are a lot of common elements between Australia and the United States. So I guess I've got a couple of questions about that. The first one is, um, is there any impact then on the American analysis on insurance premiums that are then calculated for Australia? Um, no, perhaps I need to clarify um, my previous comment. So we, we partnered with NCAR um, with an ongoing piece of research and and this particular report that we released in November last year um, was compiled between uh, NCAR and, and IAG. But what it did was it went out and looked at all of the global literature on how severe weather events that we care about here in Australia, tropical cyclones, east coast lows, flood, hail storms, um, looked at all of their global literature um, to, and then where a, a fair portion of that literature actually came from Australian research institutions. Um, I'm not sure of the statistics, but I, I imagine at least half of the research we quote is from Australian research. And we've just basically condensed all that research into how we think extreme weather will change uh, within the Australian context did not go and estimate insurance premiums and there weren't any influence, I suppose, on how um, America looks at, I suppose, the risk to insurance premiums. It, it was completely isolated from that. Okay, so if I can put it another way, um, despite the fact that you're looking at extreme weather pictures around the world, if um, you saw, and I'm thinking of cyclones, for example, in the United States, we get to hear about those a lot. Um, you know, if there are lots of these extreme events outside Australia, but none in Australia, then there wouldn't be there would be no impact at all on insurance premiums paid by Australian households. Um, I, I think I understand the question. You're, you're saying that if 
I'm looking at the interrelationship. Really I'm trying to get an idea yeah, so of the impact of, okay. of overseas information. Well, I guess if I can put it in a global way, overseas events, overseas information, and let's say um, a demonstrated use of technology to avoid an extreme event arising in another jurisdiction and what the impacts would be on the, um, and perhaps uh, Mr. Padham can also uh, come in on this if, if it's relevant, but does that have any impact on the assessment of risk in Australia and then the assessment of insurance premiums? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm struggling to quite understand the question. Can I, there's, maybe there's two connections um, and let me know if I've got this right. So there's, um, the insurance industry buys insurance called reinsurance. Yep. And those reinsurers are global in nature and the cost of that capital um, to offset some of our uh, exposure as an insurance company is impacted by global events. So you can have a very active hurricane season in the, in the US, for instance, may impact on the cost of borrowing that capital. Um, does, does that answer the one of the yes, questions? It does answer one of them. It doesn't answer it completely because I guess you, you initially st said that talked about the similarity between the Australian experience and the American experience, for example, in a lot of um, events and bushfires one could see could be, you know, we heard about the wildfires in California. So I was just wondering uh, as when you're trying to assess risk and looking at the extent of devastation perhaps in the different parts of the world, to what extent do you bring that together to work out what your risk calculation is for Australia? And that then flows on, I assume, to insurance premiums. Yeah, so there's the, the way we analyse or try to understand severe weather risk within um, climate modelling, for instance, the severe weather phenomena, the severe thunderstorms, the tropical cyclones or hurricanes, as they're called in the US, have very similar characteristics. So there's a lot of um, mutual research into the subject matter of tropical cyclones, which is quite transferable to one from one region to the next. But there are particular nuances that you must understand within say, the Australian domain that are quite different. So you can't just pluck something off the shelf that was done in the US to say um, that applies to the east coast of Queensland, for instance, because there's very important features of our climate system around uh, Australia that actually won't allow that to happen. But some of the sensitivity studies, understanding general effects on increasing ocean temperature, for instance, that, that provides a lot of insight into how um, cyclones in general will respond. And that, that kind of thing is quite transferable. Are bushfires as transferable? Bearing in mind some yes, of the evidence we heard this morning about particular weather events and climate drivers in Australia? Yeah, the principles are the same, but the unique conditions or weather systems that set up fire conditions might um, be quite different. Okay. So you've got the same kind of prolonged temperature, um, but how they come about and become, I suppose, exacerbated by extreme fire, you might have a few different mechanisms to um, think about there. Okay, that just takes me through, I guess, to my question to Dr. Crompton. And again, you may have explained it thoroughly and I may have just missed it. You probably did explain it thoroughly and I probably did miss it. But I'd like to ask you some questions about the distance of buildings from um, uh, the bushland. Now, I understand the one metre point, and I think you uh, made a very telling comment, actually, in your written report about how um, in some ways they could be seen as part of the fuel load when they're that close. But I'm trying to understand the differences that you've observed over time uh, in, the, uh, em in the ember transfer, if I can call it that, or, um, uh, with the bigger distances and how has that, was that particularly different in the, two th in the 2019, 2020 Black Summer fires? I mean, did that, I, I didn't quite follow it, you know, from the diagram. Is that, is that something that's always happened, has happened a lot before, or is, was this a particular occasion where the, that ember movement was unusually, or for the first time, as, as great as it was? 
certainly in Duffy. So the the thing that was in common uh, between the the 2003 fire in Duffy uh, in, in Canberra and the Rapville fire in uh, northern New South Wales is that both of them had very were occurred under very strong winds. So that enabled the embers to travel a long distance. So we have seen that before in, in the Canberra fire. It also has to do with the, the way that the building environment is also set up as well in terms of how close it is to the bushfire or not. There was separation in uh, in, in the case of Duffy. Uh, so, I mean, if, if not being if being strong winds, then perhaps, and I'm speculating, the, the damage in Duffy may not have been as bad because there was some separation of 40 metres. Uh, but certainly we have had strong winds in the past. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll leave it to the others. Occurring a couple of or questions. coinciding with fire. fire. Thank and, you very much. And, and from memory, they are very tall trees just to the west of Duffy uh, as well. Commissioner yeah. McIntosh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll go to Mr Lapastria first if I could. Can I take you to the, uh, the, extreme, the severe weather and climate change report, which for our purposes is... Uh, it is page, Operator page 46. If I may assist, oh, if I may assist, Commissioner, IAG.001.001.0046. Ah, oh, here it is. Too quick. Too quick. Too quick. Um, on, uh, for your purposes, page 46, there's a statement here that there is significant scope for next generation models like NARCLIM to provide a more comprehensive and granular base for establishing fire weather risk indices and understanding the impacts of climate change. I just wondered whether you could, and I, you noted this before as well, give us a bit more flavour about that. So are there, are there manifest efficiencies with our existing indices and are there known abilities for us to improve what we're currently using? Yes, I think we, we've we've met with um, EPIE and uh, the principal meteorologists in my team, in particular, uh, on the next generation and what opportunity that would uh, be available to really, uh, I suppose, establish uh, fire weather indices that are um, as as informative of the actual fire itself. Uh, as possible. So I mentioned before about the forest fire danger indice, indice MacArthur forest fire danger indice is, is an aspect of how to look at fire weather risk, but there's some other indices such as Haynes and C. Haynes um, that will provide extra information. Um, I, I'm not across the detail of the next generation models. It's something that I would normally refer to uh, the principal meteorologist in my team. Um, but I believe there's going to be finer resolution uh, of those models which will allow to provide more granular um, output, more specific to uh, locations. Thanks very much. If I could, I'll direct a, a similar style question to um, Mr Padham. And this comes from your statement. You have their comments about, um, firstly, about the, the capacity to have uh, improved meteorological and other data capture, including a program of investment, improved weather stations across Australia. Could you just talk to that a bit more? Are there, is there, again, is there known weaknesses with our existing weather stations? Yes, so there's a, there's a range of areas uh, that, that we can improve the observational data that we use within our um, within the cat, cat modelling that we do, um, and what this uh, recommendation that we outlined in our um, in, in in my witness statement talks to is uh, capturing better um, uh, observational data. Uh, yes, in, improved weather stations uh, would would be very helpful for that, including um, a better coverage across Australia. Um, as well as um, ensuring we uh, things like anemometers uh, are all upgraded across all of them. Um, I would say that um, this would be an area that the Bureau of Meteorology can help with uh, rather than uh, ourselves, but we understand that we would want more information. 
Um, an example as well about, uh, say, the other data capture, if we compare with, say, uh, what happens in the United States around capturing data on tropical cyclones, where they have facilities and they, they regularly fly aeroplanes into tropical cyclones to gather data about those tropical cyclones and uh, how they're behaving and trying to understand uh, what's going on within uh, the, the cyclones or the hurricanes as they would be there. Uh, we don't have that facility in Australia. Um, and I think as the risk increases over time, um, understanding uh, uh, the behaviour of um, landfalling Australian tropical cyclones, we do need more observational data. Um, I think Mark has made the point earlier about um, the, some of the information that we need is particularly around the ones that are hitting landfall and the processes at a local level of what happens to tropical cyclones, um, and we, we're not capturing that data. Indeed, in many, in many cases, uh, what we see in tropical cyclones is that uh, wind speed uh, measuring, things like anemometers, uh, get blown away um, or break during a tropical cyclone. So we actually don't get that reliable data sometimes for actual events that's happened in the past. Thanks very much. One last one, if I may, Chair. Um, in uh, the paragraph or dot point two two down for that one, and it reads: Public availability of flood hazard maps across Australia. Currently, these are driven by individual councils, including a consistent specification for such studies. Um, the inference there being that we currently have a, a weakness or a deficiency in our flood mapping. I just wondered whether the other participants, Ryan or sorry, uh, Dr. Crompton or Mr. Lapastria, whether you two would agree with with that statement made by Mr. Padham. Yes, would you? Oh, you go first, Dr. Crompton. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, uh, Mr. Lepastri, are you going? I just missed oh, you then. You're yeah. in the lead. <laughs> you can go first if you've got something to say. So, so Commissioner McIntosh, just to make sure that I heard the question correctly, uh, it is whether there are deficiencies in council flood studies. Was that the question? Yes, there seems to be a statement from Mr. Padham that, in, that implies or even states that there seems to be weakness with our availability of flood hazard maps. Uh, I mean, Mr. Padham, please add if I've misinterpreted that. So uh, I, I guess I guess the background to this question, uh, this uh, may be in order. So we do have something called the National Flood. Um, insurance database, uh, which is maintained by um, the Insurance Council of Australia, and I believe uh, Risk Frontiers has a role in that as well. Um, so there's a, that process uh, provides insurers with access to uh, much better information today than we had, say, 10 years ago um, uh, in terms of that. But there's a what that, what that process relies on is uh, a large part of that relies on getting information from local councils who undertake individual flood studies. Um, the, the problem is, is that may, uh, there's a substantial amount of work that the, the NFID team have to do to then um, sort of collate them together because different councils will use different measures. Some will say use a one in 100 um, um, mapping. Some will use different versions of that. Um, and we don't necessarily have coverage across the whole country. There are also issues regarding um, the, I guess, the use of that data. Uh, councils uh, don't always allow us to make that information public. Um, that's, so that's one part of it, the quality of the data and, and the difficulties in obtaining it, even though we have the NFID. But the second part to this comment here is about making that available to the public uh, in a much more consistent way. Um, some of the restrictions that uh, councils place on the use of their data means that uh, insurers aren't necessarily able to give that information out uh, to the public. And that's, I think, a from a public perspective, which is where I'm coming from, from the actions of Duke, we think that would be a, a much, would be a very useful information for the public to know. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Can I then direct to, to Mr. Lepastor and uh, Dr. Crompton, just uh, do you agree with those statements? Are that something that, that you've encountered problems with both quality and, and accessibility? 
You go first, Dr. Crompton. Sure. So, I mean, in terms of accessibility, so Risk Frontiers has been a part of the development of the National Flood Information uh, since the end of 2008 for the Insurance Council. So, prior, prior to that, we had embarked upon collecting flood studies from local councils previously and were developing using that uh, uh, to develop a flood uh, modelling capability. Uh, the experience... Uh, Reflecting on that experience is that it was not always easy to be able to access flood studies from, from some local councils. Um, and since ENFID, uh, the inception of ENFID, uh, the ICA, the Insurance Council of Australia, have been the ones that have been responsible for uh, collecting flood studies. Thank you. Mark, do you have anything? I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Lothastri, do you have anything to add? Yes, I'd like to. Yeah, so to answer your first question, I, I do agree with um, with Sharon Jett's statement. That's a fairly um, correct statement from my perspective. But I would like to add, um, there's been a lot of progress in recent times with state government coordinating um, uh, flood mapping um, on behalf of local government. I'm not across the detail. It's, it's, it's actually a conversation I had with my principal hydrologist earlier today. Um, so there's a lot of good progress in trying to um, coordinate at the state level. Uh, but the reality of today's flood mapping that's underpinning most of the um, areas around Australia, it is part of the legacy data that has a lot of problems with um, consistency in its format and availability of the uh, accurate full depth information across a range of floods which you need. But, it's, but it is a, a good news story on one front as far as the significant progress over the last decade or so. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Padam, just want and just need to clarify for me, why wouldn't the information that's there be made available? Is it an accuracy issue or are there other reasons? Um, Commissioner, I, I've not personally been involved in the uh, obtaining that information. So this is this is more uh, what what I'm observing in terms of the teams I work with uh, and the, the issues and challenges they face. Uh, I believe it's it's a it's a combination of technical problems, um, but also I, I do understand that uh, councils are concerned as well about any liability issues that may arise from wider availability of some of this data. Um, and that's not an area that I have any expertise in, but I believe it has been a, an issue that has uh, affected the collation and sharing of this information. Okay, thank you very much for that. Mr. Lepastri, any comment on that part of it? Then I have a question for you, another question for you. I do, yes. Um, I like to, again, it's, I'm not in the actual detail, but my understanding from the specialists in my team that some of the restrictive, uh, some of the license terms of which the flood study was done may not uh, allow a council to share the information. We must also emphasise that some of these studies are very large in volume as far as data concerns, and so there are costs involved in uh, making it available. And so that's one of the in the recommendations in my statement is around how we can actually have funding on a regular basis to help, uh, I suppose, compile a, a database to facilitate that um, access, uh, as well as um, making sure the studies that are done are done under the right sort of licensing um, conditions that enable uh, broader sharing. Okay, I appreciate that. In that case, I'll take you to... Miss, uh, Dr. Crompton's report. So, RYC.500.001, page 0008. And so that's the uh, figure three that we had before. Quite a good, good diagram, this one. So, similar question to the flood information. So, first of all, Mr. Lepastria, I assume you would take this information that, that's here. Uh, and that would 
form a part of your risk analysis when you're looking at uh, insuring properties or properties in communities uh, around Australia? Would that be right? Yes, that's that's correct. And I think if I could add a, a piece to it as well is we have to understand the um, the probability of different intensity levels of fire to make sense of this kind of um, graph. Because not every fire will follow a particular, I suppose, uh, trajectory here as far as the percentage of houses burnt within a certain um, distance to vegetation. It will depend on the fire conditions of the day, whether it was a very rare catastrophic fire or whether it was, um, I suppose, uh, not quite as severe conditions. Um, but that is that kind of information is the basis to help us understand uh, risk. That's right. No, no, the conditions of the day would be one variable that you would be difficult to control. But the data here has a level of control that could be put into to place. So we've been talking about, uh, from an IAG perspective, being quite reactive in how you take all this data and you look to look at your risk. Um, does IAG take this sort of data and then try and inform governments and uh, at local government level and up in uh, in planning uh, and the like to try and look to reduce the risk on those variables that uh, that they can? Yes, yeah, so we haven't done so much on bushfire. We've done a lot more on things like flood. It's a much more mature risk modelling framework that's fairly consistent in how we look at it from a land planning, floodplain management perspective, as well as how an insurer would look at the risk from a, to understand pricing and its, um, its exposure from large flood events. But for bushfire, it's not quite as mature in how we look at uh, the risk, um, the risk holding framework. And that's one of the things I would like to uh, suggest that we try and move towards as a community. There are bushfire risk models out there and, and Dr. Cromp can, can talk about the ones that they've developed, but we're not um, talking, well, well, the ones that are out there are not necessarily both used for underpinning, say, land planning requirements as well as, say, insurance risk assessment. And I think we've got to somehow work towards um, a common base there, so we're talking the same language. Okay, I appreciate that, and thank you very much for the for the answer. We we will be coming back, I think, on at some stage on this this particular area. I've got one more question, but before that, I'll go to Commissioner Bennett. Oh no, I got more. Trust me. Um, uh, can I uh, just the, the, the final one? It's more just trying to understand again the data uh, of it. If I go to IAG.001 dot zero zero one dot zero zero two nine which is figure six which is bushfire risk we'll put it up so that there, there's that diagram which we'll visit quite quickly so as I understand it that's the risk score by LGA across Australia of bushfire risk can we go to the next one which is figure seven please which goes in on Victoria New South Wales and I'm just interested on in the top one there just interested in how this is determined. If I look just east of Albury there on the border, uh, in Victoria I guess we're very high, but in New South Wales we're medium. Now I've seen the Murray River, it's not that big, so why would it be on one side very high and on the other side medium, please? Um, okay, so I've I'm not sure I can answer your question there. This is this data came from um, the ICA, I believe, the ILEAD data set. I'm not. I wasn't part of the actual analysis of how they rolled up, um, but I suspect this is an artifact of uh, the way we look at um, bushfire risk management, and we things stop at state borders, so we don't necessarily have continuous information across a state boundary. Uh, the natural hazards will, floods, bushfires, uh, coastal erosion, don't care about state borders. And that's one of the, um, I suppose, aspects the federal government could help um, facilitate. OK, 
Okay, so you, you think this is probably more a consistency of data sets and the way they're, they're measured? Yes, I, I, I believe that's probably the case. Okay, thank you very much for that. Commissioner Bennett. Well, that takes me straight into actually one area that I've, a couple of questions I wanted to ask. You, there's been some discussion about information and information sharing, and I noticed that in particular Mr Patton pointed out that, you know, there were some key limitations of the AACI and it doesn't incorporate certain information about exposure and vulnerability, and so there is missing information that you'd probably like to bring to bear. And you spoke about the difficulties of getting certain information. If, if each of you were king for a day, as it were, and was able to... Um, set up a plan for the sorts of information to which you would want access if you could get it in order to do your jobs better. Um, and we could take fire as the example, bushfire. Um, where would you be looking for that information if you could, if you could get it freely with all the you know, appropriate um, uh, confidentiality regimes or whatever in place, or copyright or whatever it is you want to you know, deal with? Where would you be, what, what would you want to set up? I mean, I don't know who wants, I don't mind, who goes first? <laughs> Mr Lepastro is laughing. Mr Patton, why don't you go first? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to go first, um, uh, but I, I will say I wouldn't have all the answers here. I, I think it's interesting that uh, we've, you, you've taken, Commissioner, and quite, quite right, you've given recent events, bushfire as an example. Um, I think one comment I will make is that, uh, especially if we go back to some of the evidence uh, Dr. Crompton has provided in terms of the financial, the insured impact of bushfires, um, generally speaking, and that this is this is a statement of probably about the past and not necessarily about the future. Uh, bushfires have not generated substantial. Uh, insurance losses with a few exceptions, such as uh, the Black Saturday uh, number. And what tends to happen is um, it, it, when we think about the risk from natural hazards, it's, it's intersection both of the hazard, uh, the fire itself, but also the exposure where it's happening and, and the vulnerability in terms of what are the protections in place. Um, now, with bushfires, uh, the insurance exposure is in the things we actually provide insurance coverage for tend to be in cities and tend to be in big cities, uh, in the middle of the cities. Um, so where uh, bushfires start to have an impact on insurance is when they are on the edge of suburbs or um, uh, yeah, generally on the edge of cities. And what we find, so for example, um, uh, one of the figures uh, quoted by uh, Dr. Crompton in his uh, testimony has been there was about 3,000 homes that were destroyed by over the um, over the black summer. Um, now that that's a, a very large number, and there's inc uh, there that's caused a lot of problems for a lot of people. And I'm not trying to uh, uh, underplay that, but in an insurance portfolio more broadly, um, for example, if we look at the hailstorms that hit Canberra. Um, a few months ago, uh, in 15 minutes, those hailstorms damaged a whole suburb. So they were hitting, um, they were hitting things in the middle of a city and caused substantial financial loss. And if we were to do it per second of natural disaster, that would weigh far more than six months of bushfire okay. did from an insurance. Thank you. So I think that you know, and I think. Um, it would be wrong, um, I, as an actuary, I would say it would be wrong to focus on natural disasters purely in terms of insured losses. They have far broader impact. And insurance is almost the piece at the end that uh, tries to financially compensate people because and it's, it's a suboptimal outcome because people's lives, even if they're insured to the full extent of their damage, are very adversely affected by these natural disasters. Thank you. Um, so there's some things you can't compensate for. Thank you. Um, I'm so also I, looking for missing information. So Sure, sure. All right, I'm going off track here. But so from, from my point being that from an insurance perspective, I don't think bushfire would be the one that I would say we would want to focus resources on. My, uh, in terms of financial risk, uh, floods and... Um, 
tropical cyclones are far bigger um, financial risks. And for do you us have all the information you need? Are you satisfied you've got all the information available to enable you to do your job on that, on those other areas, then, uh, no. on natural disasters? No. Well, that was that was one of the questions I'm asking. Where where would you be looking for for that information that you're not getting at the moment that you would want to have sources? So, uh, so there's there's different levels of information. First of all, there is underlying raw observational data, uh, which I talked about previously in terms of weather stations and ability to uh, examine some of uh, these events. I think secondly is the is then coding that into hazard maps to understand. Sorry, I, I should what interrupt you just for a second. I'm not looking at uh, only looking at raw data. I'm looking at where you believe there is information that has already been collated, perhaps for other purposes, to which you don't have access, that you would like to have access, like depart government departments, other entities. If, no. if you are a supremo of information, the supremo of information gathering, and you could get it from where you where you knew it was. I'm just just trying to work out. You know, there's been some talk about not having sufficient information. So I just want to know where would you be looking? I, I don't know. Perhaps I can see um, Mr. Lapastri and, and Dr. Crompton are nodding too. So I um, perhaps I, you know if yeah. we could. Uh, why don't you think about it, Mr. Patton? Why don't we go and see if if Mr. Lapastri can help me on this one? Sure. Okay, so I think I understand the question. You're saying of what we know exists, what would, what would be our wish list in access to it? Yes, where so you know there might be information that can actually help you make these predictions and work out exactly what you need to do, and you and you can't get access at the moment, but you believe you you know you would that access would be helpful. Yeah, so if we start with flood, there are still pockets of um, flood studies that exist that aren't made available to insurers uh, or perhaps more widely to the general public. And I think the ICA could help provide a list um, of some of those areas uh, where we struggled to actually get the data, uh, even though we know it exists within Council. Do you make um, all of your data we... freely available to everybody else? Um, in the, I don't mean everything you do in your life. I mean in terms of, of um, you know, assessment of natural disasters and the information that you need to come to a conclusion on predictions. Uh, no, no, we don't disclose everything we do. We're not, we're unable to in some circumstances because perhaps we don't own the data. Right. Uh, we are trying to um, release information where we can in a very carefully considered way that also protects uh, the privacy issues of our customers' data. So the the release of our severe weather report is one of those examples of where we said this is better that we release this um, so we can get other input uh, and also to help others in trying to establish some of those central sources of information. We're also driving some projects um, through either jointly in the past, say with IAG Suncorp water ingress study that we did with James Cook University, where we're trying to drive some of the insights we have within our claims data to help inform the building industry and building codes on how we could tighten up risk. And there's a couple of projects uh, in the ICA at the moment. I'm the chair of the data and knowledge um, group of the Climate Action Committee. So there's two projects there where we're using insurance data to help inform um, the damage that arises to modern construction um, in the floodplain or tropical cyclones. Thank you. So we are releasing, carefully releasing us. But back to your first question, there's a couple of data sets, particularly say on coastal erosion. I know a very good study was done for the Victorian government, uh, looking at coastal erosion under different sea level rise scenarios. And I'm, I don't believe that data set is necessarily available publicly, but it's something that's absolutely needed uh, from a national perspective. Um, to, um, to roll out right across the nation under under one kind of common format. Thank so you. I know that exists and that would be very uh, informative for um, not just insurers but the community at large. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Dr. Crompton? Dr. Crompton, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, only just a, a couple of, you know, examples. So. Sticking with, with bushfire, so there will be information that 
uh, is held around what the different types of ignition sources are. So that sort of information is certainly helpful. Um, there's a whole range of ignition sources from arson through to natural ignition sources. Um, going to the damage that uh, the the information that was used to produce uh, um, that data has been collected from Risk Frontiers, either commissioning their own uh, services to collect some of that data through aerial imagery. Uh, in the case of the South Coast fire, uh, that was the information was collected uh, on, you know, literally on the ground. I mean, that we had some support from the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC on that front, uh, but. Collecting that data using other various forms of remotely sensed uh, techniques as well. Um, in, again, sticking with New South Wales, the, about half or just over uh, Lake like and Mary's, we survey just over half the number of buildings. Uh, and that's, you know, some of these studies, as, as I said, are us literally going out to, into the field and driving around on a house by house basis. So collecting this information uh, that is, is really uh, so important. Uh, things like, you know, turning to the tropical cyclones that was mentioned earlier, you know, the amount of anemometer data that, and the, you know, in terms of the network uh, that is available is, is, could be a lot more comprehensive to inform the development of a tropical cyclone wind field. Uh, we provided some seed funding to the cyclone testing station in, at, up at James Cook University many years ago for them to uh, develop some mobile tech wrecked when a, a tropical cyclone was approaching land. And, I mean, one on the hail side is, you know, the release of hail of uh, radar data. So there's been some work recently around radar, and at the moment, uh, that's being decided whether there will be that will be released under a commercial license, uh, and then finally, I think from a national perspective, one of the very big gaps uh, is maintaining an economic loss database. The Insurance Council of Australia database of insured losses underpins so many studies from Productivity Commission uh, inquiries into natural disaster funding in 2014 through to other economic loss studies from the Bureau of Transport. Um, it is often used and the way it is extrapolated to an economic loss is, is fairly basic. And there's a lot of information which would be held in various government departments that could be pulled together uh, to create an economic loss database. Thank you. I'm going to leave it there. I think we have time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Mr Lepastor, you've got your hand up. And so does Mr. Paddock. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lepastro, can we just conclude? No, very sure. shortly, though. Go on. Mr. Can I? Mr. 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 Lepastro, go ahead, quick. please. Yes, yeah, so very quickly. In my statement, I talked about uh, a couple other places where we're sharing data externally. And um, there was one with the Bureau of Meteorology. So we're sharing um, de identified claims data to help the Bureau of Meteorology um, calibrate or validate their new generation weather radar. So that'll help, I suppose, understand, um, better understand uh, damage on the ground so they can actually fine tune their community warnings and alerts. We've got two other projects, one with the University of uh, Technology Sydney and another one with DPIE. Um, the DPIE one is looking at um, how we can use our claims data to help understand hail storm environments uh, in an ARCLIM model. Okay. So it's a better, so the NACLIM model won't model hailstorms in per, per se, but you can at least understand some of the hailstorm environments um, that lead to that. So there's a few uh, activities where we're trying to work with these partners using the claims data with some of these climate modelling um, tools. But it seems to me to be a fairly, I mean, these arrangements seem to be um, opportunistic or ad hoc or just, hap I mean, I don't mean that in a bad sense, rather than having a systematic um, wide standardised method of interaction of information. That, that's correct. But I think I think the nature of the way we fund research projects that's not a generally. No, no, no. I think, but I think there's a an opportunity to think about if we were to set up a research program to research bushfires or tropical cyclones or hailstorms, we could become much more coordinated in how we would go about that. 
So you're actually building stepping stones to a better state rather than research governed by short-term funding arrangements. So we, we do find a lot of the research being quite sort of uh, scattergun in a sense. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Mr. very much. Mr. Padam. Oh, something. Mr. Padam. Putting your hand up at a Royal Commission, that's a uh, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to say, uh, just a broadly, I was trying to answer your question, Commissioner, before in terms of new sources of data. If we are to focus on existing sources of data that we don't have complete access to, I, I'd, I'd underline uh, Mr. Leprastier's point about coastal inundation and coastal flood mapping, uh, as well as uh, tidal information and um, uh, those studies that have been undertaken by local councils. Uh, it's very, there is no centralized source or collation project for all of that across Australia. And, and I think, uh, given the evidence we've heard regarding sea level rise, that is, that is an important data set to, to, uh, make available. Um, I also would, would, um, uh, underline, uh, Mr. Leprastier's points regarding a coordinated approach because we do have, uh, and particularly an example is the, the downscaling climate modeling that's done. Currently, um, it's not necessarily, so we've talked about NARCLIM um, being uh, New South Wales centred, but there are other uh, downscaling uh, data sources, but they're not necessarily done in a consistent way. And I think there is a lot of uh, value that can be extracted from existing data by better coordinated approaches. Thank you very, very much indeed. I appreciate that. Back to the Chair. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That was, uh, that was a very good discussion. We appreciate that. Very much, Ms. Hogan Dorgan. I have no further questions for these witnesses at this time. We do anticipate that um, with Dr. Crompton and Dr. Lepastria's organisations both having foreshadowed uh, updated reports or further reports, which we do expect will be delivered during the course of this Commission's uh, work, that we will check back in with them and, and bring those updated reports to you. And if there are questions that arise from them, um, we'll be uh, um, hoping to address them through them. Uh, in those circumstances, though, might they be excused? Uh, the three gentlemen may be excused pending uh, further summons based on the, uh, the, the, the further submissions. But, gentlemen, thank you very much this afternoon. It was a, a good discussion. We got a lot out of it. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, I note the time. What it is proposed now is to complete today's evidence uh, with the evidence of a community witness. Uh, Professor Sue Townsend, who is Professor of Indigenous Australian Studies and Course Director at the Wiradjuri Language, Culture and Heritage Course at the Charles Sturt University, uh, she lost her home near Tarumba Rumba in the Snowy Mountains uh, in the Duns Road fire on the 31st of December 2019. Her evidence was taken by video in Holbrook in New South Wales on the 11th of May by Council Assisting Kess Dubby. I propose now to tender the video and the transcript of her evidence. Uh, the video is rcn.704.000.0002. And the transcript is tow.500.001.0001. And they will respectively be, it is proposed, exhibits uh, 1.4.1 and 1.4.2, respectively. The, um, as I foreshadowed, the Commission will be invited to receive a number of different uh, pre-recorded video uh, extracts of the evidence given by community witnesses. The Commission's Council have um, have. Uh, Respected, or sought to respect the restrictions that have been imposed on us all in the last two months in relation to COVID-19 and social distancing requirements. And we are thankful to the and appreciative of the assistance that has been given to us by the members of the community uh, to enable us to bring these accounts, these direct accounts to you. Um, what it is proposed that this video will commence and that the conclusion that the hearings would adjourn until tomorrow morning. Uh, the video of, from uh, Professor Townsend's examination is about 59 minutes long uh, and the transcript will be available in due course. Thank you for that. We'll take the video and the transcript uh, as exhibits, as marked.
We will watch the video and at the end of the video we will take an adjournment until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Thank you. Ms. Hogan. Commission, please. Okay, um, I'm a Wiradjuri person. Um, I grew up in a number of different places and was in and out of care um, during my childhood. Um, I didn't get much of an education as a child, particularly when I was in care, but I went to university when I was in my mid-twenties. So I had three children um, in my early twenties and my marriage broke up by my mid-twenties. So I'd been married to a Vietnam veteran who was quite a bit older than me. Um, and so it was a violent relationship and um, myself and my children moved in to stay to escape that. So I spent quite a lot of my um, life up until my mid-40s um, poor, um, very poor, but by my mid-30s I had firmly established myself within an academic career and by that stage I um, was earning um, enough money to be comfortable, more than comfortable, and to you know, achieve home ownership and, and by my mid-40s I'd met my second husband. So I spent 20 years as a single parent um, and so by my mid-40s I was comfortable and then two years ago um, we sold our properties in Sydney and bought at Tumbarumba where we moved um, because I was asked to come back home as a Wiradjuri person and to take on the role of leading the Wiradjuri language program. Um, when we sold our homes in Sydney, we were out of debt for the first time. So we're very much looking forward to, in five years' time, retiring, and my husband retired as we moved down to support me with my new position. Yeah. Um, you said you, you put yourself through education through university. Can you tell me what you studied? Um, well, I started off at university when I was 26 years old and I started a BA. Um, I started in psychology and sociology, didn't like psychology, um, but loved sociology. Within two years, um, I had moved from Queensland to New South Wales. Um, and I was homeless during that period of time and I'd been homeless a couple of times as a child as well. Um, but I, while I was homeless, I was studying still with my children and um, I decided I needed a job that I knew that I could get. Um, be employable in, not that you can't with a BA but it's easier if you go into a professional area and I took up a Bachelor of Social Work. Um, a number of people had suggested to me that I do social work but I was always resistant to moving into the field because of my experiences as part of the Stolen Generations. And so you did a Bachelor of Social Work? I did a Bachelor of Social Work and as I completed my Bachelor of Social Work um, the head of the program suggested that I enrol into a PhD. It took me seven years to do my Bachelor of Social Work. Um, one of my sons had cancer um, and so I dropped out for his treatment and then came back and finished it and then went into the um, PhD. That took a long time because I worked full time. I had cancer myself during that time um, and a lot of things happen as life does. So it took me nearly 14 years to finish my PhD. But during that time of my PhD, I was fortunate enough to be employed within universities, um, first overseeing an Aboriginal program um, at a university and then moving into the social work program at UNSW um, and finishing there nearly two years ago. Um, when I left, I was the Associate Professor of Social Work, Indigenous Social Work. Yeah. Um, and then I've come to Charles Sturt University. Well, thank you very much. Um, 
So you came to Tumbra about two years ago, is that right? Yes, two years ago. So we had bought a property um, nearly 12 months beforehand, a large property um, off Elliot's Way, and it was at the back of the forestry, and we were going to build out there, but the roads, um, really you couldn't have got anything, any building it material out there because of the state of the road mm -hmm. and we went to forestry about the oh sorry first off we went to council about the road and council said that it was forestry's responsibility and then we went to forestry and forestry said it was council's so we were going to argue with them but in the meantime I'd already spent nearly six months driving between Grossvale and the Hawkesbury and um, to Wagga um, back and forth. I'd spend three to four nights a week in Wagga and then three to four nights a week back home with my husband and the travelling was too much. Um, so we discussed it and we decided we'd rent a place in Tumbarumba. Even though I was working in Wagga, we had decided to move to Tumbarumba. And um, we, well, we were looking for a rental property, a little house kept popping up um, that was outside of town, nearly 10 k's out, and it was cheaper the mortgage for that property than to rent. And so we bought this little two-bedroom workers' cottage um, out on Bago Forest Road, and again, backing onto a forest, but we didn't need to go through the forest to get to the house, and the road was bitumen. Um, the original idea was that we would live there until we could deal with council and forestry and get the road fixed and build out at our original property, which was um, 122 acres, and the little property was six and a half. But after, so we moved in um, 18 months ago into that house, and after having spent the reality of a winter, um, at Tumbarumba, knowing how bad the road was, knowing the difficulties about who was responsible for the road, we decided we'd stay in the little house and that we would then later, um, after we'd retired, sell the big property, but in the meantime, we'd keep the big property as you know a camp for ourselves and the family for holidays and weekends. Um, and so, we decided that we would extend the big house and uh, sorry the big house the little cottage um because we thought if we're going to stay here we need to make it livable and comfortable for us and it was just even though there was only the two of us it was just a little bit too small and we haven't taken insurance out at that point because it was a temporary situation and by the time we decided we would stay at that property and that we would extend. My husband said, let's put the insurance on when we finish the extensions. Mm -hmm. We bought the material for the extensions um, and yeah, so, and we were going to be building in January this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you still, do you still have the large property outside of town as well? Yes, yeah. um, which was also affected by the fires, but of course we had no buildings yeah. there, so... Yeah. Um, can you tell me a bit about Tumbarumba, the town, the community? Um, it's a very small community. Um, very friendly so you quite often hear of places where you're not a local until you've been there for 20 years. First off I think because we weren't living in town um, and I work so I'm quite often in Wagga so I don't spend a great deal of time in town. People just assume that we were one of the tourists I think coming through um, but once people started to realise that we were living there and therefore locals, um, people have been extremely supportive, friendly, people have gone out of their way to make us feel like that we're part of the local community. Um, for my husband, it's easier when he's retired and he goes into town every day to have coffee at the bakery, um, but he's also 
a lot chattier where I'm a bit more reserved until I get to know people. Um, interestingly, I found a cousin um, in town and even though our families are from Uabalon out west, um, we've ended up living in the same town even though we never even knew of each other's existence beforehand because of the history of, for our families. Um, so it's very nice and then the local um, Aboriginal community has also been very accepting as well and um, ensured that me and my husband who's also Aboriginal um, but from further north in New South Wales um, have felt very much a part of that community as well so we've been able to in a relatively short time feel like that we're very much a part of that community and have some very strong friendships. Yeah. Yes. Turning now to the, the lead up to the recent bushfire season, yeah. can you speak a little bit about anything that you heard about communications about the bushfire season coming? Well, no, and um, like there were fires that were happening around Sydney, um, you could see the fires, of course the smoke and all of that was coming in, but I suppose almost silly, um, I assumed we were safe. Even though I did on a logical level know that we live near forestry, that we're in the bush, that there was always risk of bushfires. And one of the things that we said when we decided to stay at the little house was that if ever there was a big fire come through the forest, that we could be trapped at the big property because you have to come through the forest to get out of that property. And one side of that property has... Um, state forest, the other boundary line has the national park. So in the little house, even though we're in the bush, the end of the road was the forest, it just didn't seem like there was such a threat there. And the other thing is Tumbarumba is so wet mm. and green. So we knew there were fires around, but the, yeah, and the townspeople had spoken about fires in the past and that there was a lot of build up and if ever there was a fire come through it would be a big one but it just wasn't really on the radar at that point and we were seeing around Sydney and then up and around Newcastle and it was horrendous but for for us it just didn't seem like a threat at that point in time every summer you know, no matter where we lived and our previous property was also um, semi-rural so you always had it in the back of your head and you did things like clean the gutters of the house out and keep the yard clean but we weren't on alert for it and nobody was saying anything about really being on alert at that point in time. Were you, did you make those preparations? Like, Were you doing anything around your property? Yeah, yes. yes. We just did also both this property and our previous property, we were on tank water. So you always clean the leaves out because yeah. of your water yeah. supply. But um, funnily, we had gone away for Christmas. We um, shouted ourselves a 10 day cruise at an expensive time. We got a balcony cabinet. And we said, we're gonna really shout ourselves. We're out of debt. We're very comfortable, so let's do this. And we decided we'd do something similar every year. That's off the table now, but um, we had decided that every year we were going to go away, either Christmas or New Year's Eve, and we weren't gonna scrimp and scrave about it. We were just gonna treat ourselves because of how hard we worked um, and how hard we worked through the year. Um, on the boat, people, when they found out we were from New South Wales, people were saying, oh, the fires, and I said, no, we're safe. Um, it's, it's lush, it's green, it's wet out there. You get up in the morning until 9, 10 o'clock, the ground's wet. You know, 6, 7 o'clock at night, the ground's wet again. So we're fine. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Where did you go on a cruise to? Uh, we went up um, around New Caledonia. Yes. So, yes. So, so you went out on the cruise. Yep. And then you came back. And we came you, back. You weren't concerned before you arrived back. No. So when we drove out of Sydney, um, out of Tumbarumbo, driving into Sydney on the 17th, the smoke was really heavy and um, yeah, it was it was distressing in many ways to see what was ha happening. Um, 
and we came back on the 28th and we drove Sydney wasn't so bad but as we came down the on the Hume Highway roughly where Wollong in line with Wollongong the smoke was really heavy again um, and so we'd actually talked about how distressing it was to be coming back into this and we got home about six o'clock on the 28th in the evening and we were just sh shocked everything was dry and it was brown so our green grass was brown the leaves on the trees were all dry um, it was just scorched the next day we heard that there was a fire the Duns Road fires um, that there was a fire um, near Adelong and Adelong was under threat um, but we didn't think too much, you know, it's quite a distance away. And then on the 30th um, in the evening, we heard those fires were not under control and they were moving, and, but they still weren't that close to us. And about 11 o'clock on the night of the 30th, I said to my husband, I think we need to actually think about these fires, not that... Yeah, it was that immediate, but over the next couple of days, maybe we might want to sort things out. He thought that I was just panicking, um, and we went to bed at 11 o'clock. At 2.30 in the morning, we were woken with a knock at the front door by the Rural Fire Brigade telling us that we needed to go. And that were they doing that to everyone in the, in the township or in the area? Yeah, so they were in the street telling people yeah. we needed to go, and they said that it wasn't a question of if it came it was coming yeah. and that we had approximately two hours uh, so what did you do then um i ran around just chucking everything i could into the car um and my husband was very cool and calm and we have a very large Clydesdale horse who doesn't like to be floated and if he picks up on any form of stress or panic he just stands and he won't be moved. So I said to my husband to get the horse out and we had to walk him. So he got him down to the bottom of the street and then we moved a couple of cars and the boat down to the bottom of the street. By 4.30, um, friends of ours who had lived in our street but had moved to the other side of town, um, they came up to help us and I went to their house and our friend and my husband stayed behind wedding down our house and our property and they stayed until about 11 o'clock when it got too dangerous. 11 a.m. in the morning? Yeah, yeah 11 a.m. Yeah. So I went across to my friend's place um, and her, her and her 19-year-old um, son helped us get the cars from where my husband and her husband had left the cars and we got them into town So, because we've got about five cars, um, which we've still got. We've got no house, but we've got lots of cars. Um, so we got them out and I went and sat over at her house and this by about six o'clock at six thirty in the morning we'd done all of this running around and we're sitting at her place and eight o'clock in the morning we got a knock at the door that we had to vacate her property as well and then we went back into town to her parents place the local elders is it back into tumbarama back in yeah and is all this with the clydesdale as well um with the clydesdale we couldn't get through the roadblock and we had to leave him in a paddock we were able to go and get him at three o'clock that afternoon and they walked him the rest of the way into town. So then that, that's the, the first night you're in, in Tumbarumba? So we stayed for the day um, with friends. So my husband stayed at the house until 11 um, and the wall of flames were on three sides of him and he decided then that he couldn't do anything further and got in the car and got out. But he, it, he was lucky to get out. Yeah. Um, very lucky because the flames were racing down the road so um and then he came to the friend's place as well um our friend the husband that stayed with him he then went off and tried to help save other things in town um and so we had um another person who a good friend in town 
um, and she's, she'd already vacated very early that morning to one of her daughter's places um, down in Albury, Wodonga, and she said, just take over my house, just take whatever you want um, and stay for however long you need to. So were most of the people, the local people, in the downtown area of the town at that point? Um, yeah, just about everybody had come into town, uh, well, or else had already vocated outside of Tumbarumba. Um, so a lot of people had gone to Wagga or Albury by that stage. We stayed until the Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and what on the f it, yeah the fires were burning. They were starting to talk about town burning, and the Thursday afternoon um, we'd gone for a briefing at the hall, and there were daily briefings, and we'd gone for the briefing, and they'd said they wanted everybody out of Tumbarumba by Friday lunchtime. They okay. didn't think the town was going to survive the weekend. And so the RFS was there protecting the town, but yep. they thought it wasn't sustainable anymore? No. Yeah. So we drove the cars to Wagga, um, went back, stayed Friday night, and then um, we went into Wagga to my daughter's place in the morning, but she's got four children, um, and we registered, and then Friday night we went to my sons and Henty. The friends that were helping us, um, they of course were also evacuated. They asked the whole town to leave. Um, they had a number of animals that they didn't want to put into shelters, and but they couldn't get accommodation with their animals. Mm -hmm. So they came out to my son's place, the Henty as well. And they were there for basically a week. Um, so we all bumped down at my son's house. Before you left Tumbarumba, did you know what had happened to your house? Yes, we knew that afternoon. Yeah. Um, my husband and our friend drove back up to have a look and it was all gone then. Yeah. Yeah. So you then, you, you stayed at your son's house? Yes. While the bushfires then came through? Through, yes. And then when did you go back um, and have a look at what had happened to Tumbarumba? Well, it took a couple of weeks yeah. before we were allowed to go back up there because even that first weekend, even though the fire didn't come, there was the constant threat for a couple of weeks. So I can't remember whether it was two or three weeks afterwards. Um, but as soon as we were told that, you know, people could start going back up, we went back up and we had a look at the place then. So yeah. the first day wasn't, I don't, I don't know what it was, it, was, it wasn't it was too upsetting on that first day, but then the next time, about five days later, I went back up by myself and that's when it was really hard. Yeah, yeah. Turning to that period after the fires, yeah. and let me know if you need a break. Yeah, you yeah. Right. yeah. Um, can you maybe talk about the assistance that you got and what yeah. was helpful? Yes. And also, what could have been done a bit better, maybe? Yeah, so after the fires, within a couple of days, um, we had become aware that you could apply for some money from the federal government, um, and there was a phone number to ring. So I think it was only three, four days after the fires. Where were you staying? Oh, well, still at Henty. Still at Henty, yeah. Um, and the friends were still with us at this point. So we'd run the assistance line, and within 15 minutes, while my husband was still on the phone, he had a $1,000 placed into his bank account, and then I rang, and the, the same thing happened. These friends of ours, they went to Centrelink to apply, and um, the wife was given a $9 loan. So their house didn't burn down, um, and, but they were already on Centrelink payments and they were treating accordingly. Mm -hmm. My cousin, who's a nurse there, she also went into the Centrelink office and was told that she wasn't eligible for anything because she was employed. She works casually as a nurse. The hospital was closed. She had no work. Um, my, my cousin was in emergency accommodation in a hotel, so I was having to buy food outside. So it was really hit and missed of what happened at that point. So 
if you didn't go into the Centrelink office and you rang the assistance line, you got help. But if you went into, and, and people did thinking that it would be easier that way to get assistance, they were absolutely treated appallingly. Was, was there a specific recovery centre that people were going to at all? Well, there, there was the um, evacuation centre in Wagga where you went in and you registered. And if you needed help with housing, well, with accommodation, they would then allocate you to accommodation. Watching you know, friends and um, family go through that process. I was so glad we had my sons because the accommodation was only given for a couple of days at a time and then you had to refront and go through the whole process and, you know, the line up and people being really confused and things like that. It was, it was just... The people who were on the ground were trying really hard, but it was really bedlam because... You know, people were in shock, there was a lot of people around and people were only given two or three days at a time and then had to come back and go through the whole process again. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of information about what you could apply for but of course it was very early days so you had to be able to go and do this for yourself um, and then everything was different information from different places, the radio tell you one thing, you'd speak to somebody else, they tell you another. It was very, very confusing. Well, were there any forms of communication that you found useful, helpful? Not really. Yeah. Um, and part of that is the situation you're in at the time and where you're at, but there was, it was too conflictory. Um, and you had to be able to go and find things. So us being in Henty, we could ring Centrelink, but in the days that we were still in Tumbarumba, there was no communication. There was no TV, there was no radio. You couldn't ring people. So those three days... So no, no mobile, mobile phone? No mobile phones. No internet access? No internet access, nothing. You had to have, the info, have someone tell you that there was a meeting in town. So the very first meeting in town, we missed because we didn't know about it. But once we knew about it, then of course you knew what time the next one was scheduled. Mm -hmm. So it's that sort of thing, you have to be in the know to know, and if you're not, then you just miss out. Um, the Red Cross was very interesting. We applied for the Red Cross um, money when it was, I can't remember, it was five or ten, I think it was 10,000 the first round, um, and we applied for that and got knocked back because we didn't have any utilities bills. And, and I spoke to a person on the phone from the Red Cross saying, this is ridiculous. You know, your house is burning down. The last thing you think about grabbing is a utilities bill. And they got really annoyed with me and and it wasn't a pleasant conversation. But it was like, they need to be more helpful um, and think about what they're asking people to do. So having to jump through so many hoops. So, so when we first applied, it was 5,000. We got knocked back. We had to reapply and they'd gone to 10,000 then. And they said to us it'd take two to three weeks um, to be assessed. And so by that point, it jumped to 10,000. And then within a week, because the media had hit about the Red Cross not handing out funds and people being desperate, it went into our bank within days and it was $20,000. Um, our local St Vincent de Paul branch um, contacted us. We're going to contact them. They contacted us and gave us $1,000 straight away. And then a couple of weeks later, rang us and gave us another 3000 So we didn't have to do anything. Do you know how they knew to contact you? Um, I'm not certain. Yeah. Yeah. But I think local knowledge, yeah. people knew who had been who was on the ground and who had lost everything. Yeah. Um, so that was really, you know, that sort of thing was really helpful. And the thing, we constantly having to apply for things all the time and it comes in groups and drabs. And first off, you think, like the 20,000, you think, oh, that's a lot of money. And we went out 
thinking that we'd get back to our block really quickly and we went and bought a caravan thinking we can live in this until we get things sorted. The government taking over the clean-up, um, on one hand it's a blessing but has, on the other hand has been an absolute nightmare in that it took forever to find out whether we had asbestos on our property. How long did it take? To eight to ten weeks. Yeah. Um, we had this, so we couldn't move back there with the caravan because we didn't know if there was asbestos there or not. When we got the clearance, we put the caravan there. Um, Did you have asbestos? No asbestos. No, no asbestos. And then we moved back in, and then just as this virus was hitting us, so we heard nothing about when the cleanup was happening. Um, we found out, yeah. A, eight to ten weeks afterwards that there was no asbestos then the week before oh well the week the virus was kicking in there was a meeting um, up in Tumbarumba and there'd be quite often meetings advertised on social media so if you're someone who doesn't use social media you don't hear about it I'm assuming if you're in town you might have got a little bit more information but I don't really know but I was running the hour and a half from where we're staying back up to Tumba when I hear of a meeting and quite often they weren't meetings about the recovery as they'd been advertised. They were people um, selling stuff, wanting you to use their service to you know, fix things, whatever. It, and it was really frustrating when you'd get there and you'd find it had nothing to do with the recovery at all. Uh, Other than the asbestos issue, do, are all the services okay for your block? Do you have what you need to move back then? Um, we're in process. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got the caravan, um, but we, you know, we've got to get a water tank, get the septic back on. My husband did build a long drop with a tin thing around it for privacy. So we do have that, but we don't have water at this point, um, so we do have to get a water tank. So one of the other um, things, places that was helpful um, was the local Rotary Club, which raised some money. I don't know how much um, they raised, but they put a $100 voucher down at the local hardware store for us, so that'll pay for less than half of a water tank, but we'll be, you know, it's still a good amount off a water tank so once the clean up's finished we can order a water tank get that in then look at how to get water to that water tank so the clean up has started um so it's it's the the 11th of may today yeah so when do you think your clean up is going to be finished um well when they started which is two weeks tomorrow they said it'd be three days well on friday they hadn't finished so i'm expecting some time this week for that to be finished but um, my husband's having surgery on the 20th of may so and he'll be laid low for six to eight weeks which is over winter, so I'm now thinking that'll be about August before we'll be able to go back up there. Um, and we'll live in the caravan while we, we rebuild. So we've already started, so with um, funds that we've received to date, we've started um, sourcing recycled building material. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, besides the fact that it's cheaper than new building material, is the fact that we want to use recycle so that we're not putting that added strain constantly on the environment um, with the over-consuming, which I do partly blame for where we're at, is the way that we haven't looked after um, the earth with our consuming. Um, and so... You know, we created the environmental disasters we're living with. So we're being very mindful that we are not buying new... Well, water tank and septic tanks will be new, but all of the building material for the house will be recycled. So and we've started collecting some of that. We've got quite a bit more to go. But we've been very careful with any funds that we've received today to make sure that we... Yeah, I haven't wasted anything, but it's very expensive actually 
being homeless, so to speak. Um, you've got to replace all your clothing. We had a suitcase each of clothes. We've had to replace all our clothing. Um, we've had animals farmed out over the place that we've had to get feed to. Um, and sadly, we just lost our Clydesdale, so we've got a massive fit bill coming for that. Um, so it's not just your normal living it's much more expensive to live like this and to try and work your way through thinking about how you're going to rebuild. There's been a lot of publicity about the amount of charity, charitable donations that have been made towards the bushfires. Yeah. Um, what's your feeling on your experience of the recovery as compared with you know, that outpouring of, sort of generosity? Has, has it, do you feel like it's come through to you? Look, no, to be, we, we have had a bit of money um, and in the five months we've had around $50,000, which is a lot of money, but it's not for what's happened um, and for what we've need to lay out and we've been very, very careful with it. Um, so, and when I think about the amount that's come out, it really is a very small proportion of that. And I don't mean to sound ungrateful because I am grateful for what we have received. Um, and for us, you know, we're in a fortunate position in that I do have a very good and well-paying job. There are many people out there that don't have that. And that 50,000, if everyone has received that amount, is very, very little for what they've got to pay out at this time the living expenses, let alone the rebuilding expenses. Um, and when I, you know, read and over the weekend I read some stuff about just what the percentage is that those large organisations have handed out to people, um, it, it hasn't hasn't been enough um, and I do understand that they're saying that the building process takes time and, and it certainly does but there needs to be a better form of communication so you know yes they're planning on doing more but I have no idea of what they're planning on doing or what they expect me to do in able to access what they're planning on doing that there's just no information on it. The only information is the justification of why they haven't handed it out. There's no coordination between services. Um, no one's talking to anybody um, except for when a story hits the media and then you hear the excuses of why nothing's happening. And for me, um, yeah, hearing that this has been unprecedented, well, I sort of question that because some of these organisations are large international aid organisations. They should know how to deal with crisis on this level. And, and I would argue that in some ways, as horrible as the bushfires have been, they're easier than civil wars. So if they can manage and hopefully they can in a civil war situation because they're out there doing it all the time. Surely these bushfires were easier because no one was shooting at them. Um, I think you know, the way of moving forward from here is that there needs to be a coordinated response. People shouldn't have to, when they're in distress, um, jump through hoots to get help. When a house burns down, there's a record of that. The Rural Fire Service actually records what's happened. It goes to the government. We shouldn't have to prove that our house burnt down. And I've had to prove it at least once a month for the last five months. Um, I shouldn't have to keep going back and doing that stuff again. It should be a single, you know, one-stop shop, so to speak. Your house is burnt down, this is what we're doing for you. I shouldn't have to go and continuously feel like I'm asking for charity all the time. I shouldn't have to justify why I'm in need. I shouldn't have to feel guilty for asking. Um, which is you feel guilty when you ask? Yeah. I do. And and partly because, for, you know, there's two sides to what I'm feeling. One of it's guilt and because I do have a, a well-paying job. I am lucky. I am fortunate that way. Um, so I do feel guilty for asking. It is also um, a very mixed feeling in that I've lost so much. Um, 
why, why, do, you know, why do I have to justify why I'm in need? Um, but I do know other people are a lot worse off than me and have bigger needs than me. But the other side of that to me, for me, is also, um, I, and I get quite distressed about it, in that I've worked really hard all my life not to be dependent upon anybody else. Um, so for me being in this situation is like I've lost everything I've worked for and it, it's not just the material things, it's that not being dependent on welfare, not being dependent on anyone else, looking after myself, not feeling degraded like I did as a child, um, you know, not for me, not being welfare dependent has been a really big thing because I grew up welfare dependent. Um, I studied my PhD um, around welfare dependency. Um, so on the day of the bushfires, my husband had been out speaking with the local police officer and the local police officer told my husband my husband said um, that local police officer told him we needed to go and register as being destitute. And for me, that was the worst part out of this all, is being back at that situation of not having any control, of not being self-sufficient, of that, that's the biggest thing out of all of this. So we can't change that bit, but I think we can change the way people are made to constantly jump through hoops and to constantly have to justify why they're in need. And I think it just should be very, very easy. The properties are registered, the council knows who owns them, the money's there, and there should be a coordinated body that just says, right, and people should be in the know of, okay, I'm getting 20,000 now, there'll be another 20,000 later, and then at some other point down the road, we will be given this, this, and this. So people just, that's what's happening, rather than this complete not knowing from day to day, then hearing, oh, yes, you can go and apply for this, so then you have to go online, or you have to bring someone, and you have to go through the whole story yeah. again. Yeah. Given all of that, yeah. um, and I thank you for sharing it with us, um, can you talk a little bit maybe about the effect on the community in a mental health sense on you and your family and the community? Yep. So one, one of the things I've seen um, when I've been talking to people is that there really is a high level of distress um, and it's affecting people both physically and mentally. Um, People are a lot quieter, a lot more reserved. Now, the virus also isn't helping. So having the virus coming on top of the recovery from the fire, I think it's been a double whammy in that it has isolated us from each other. And before the virus, I was feeling quite isolated because where we were. Um, but I, just that people are a, a lot more not closed, that's not the right word, but a lot more withdrawn to what they were beforehand. Um, and while there's the support, the distress levels there, so next Has the, Do you think the support's been sufficient? Is it, was it, did it come at the right time? Is it um, well, it is and it isn't. It's, it's, all, it, it's interesting. Um, I... Sometimes the support is there, um, other times it's not quite appropriate, but I think because people just don't know how to react, and that includes some professional people as well. Um, but also when you're, well, I shouldn't say in general, but I know for me, I withdraw. And so because I am a very self-sufficient person and I don't necessarily say things, people think I'm okay. And then when yeah, you crash, people are quite surprised. Um, I think one of the things that I personally underestimated was the impact of this. Like, I did have moments where I was distressed, but then I could get up and keep going. Um, and there was stuff said in the media that this would really hit people three to four months afterwards. And it was almost like clockwork, where 
instead of getting really annoyed and really cranky. Um, and I'm not generally a cranky person, but I was um, quite cranky with the world, really. And it took a little bit for me to go, oh, hey, hang on. And then once I put my hand up, people come around. But people just don't know whether to leave you alone or whether to suffocate you, really. Yeah. Um, we, in the early days, lots of people wanting to help, you know, um, you know with emotional support, but also with giving you furniture and stuff. And it was too much too quickly. It was really overwhelming. Um, with the furniture and all of that, it was sort of like, well, what am I going to do with it? I've got nowhere to put it. Um, but even the emotional support, it was like, just get off me. I need to keep moving. Um, and, and I'm one of those people. I'm OK as long as I can keep moving forward. And I suppose what's happened for me with this fire is you can't keep moving forward. Like, there's just been too many things that haven't happened at the speed that I like to move at anyway, that you're sitting there in limbo. And that's really what I can't deal with. And from what I've seen with people around me in the community, it's that limbo that's just taking us down. So the clean-up took a long time to start happening. And I think that's been really, really difficult for us to deal with. Is that, and that's the mixed blessing. We don't have the financial stress of the clean-up, but the time to wait for it to happen was just... It just felt like nothing was ever going to happen. Um, so that feeling of limbo, and that's where I think people have been at. Um, I, I witnessed somebody have heart problems one day, talking to insurance, um, and his insurance people, um, and I actually was, I really thought that he was going to die. Um, and it's just that, you know, people are slowly breaking down um, and the virus coming along has made it even harder and so everything seems to keep hitting brick walls and we don't seem to be able to move forward and so for people like me and, and, and a lot of people in the town are those sort of people they are very stoic, um, they get on with the job and they just push through but we haven't been able to do that and I think that's what's really hurting people now. You mentioned that for you, there's a sort of cumulative edge of that you've had trauma before and now the trauma now. Yeah. The, the connection of those two actually makes it a bit worse. Beyond your personal experience, do you do you think that's also true of Indigenous communities that are affected by this? Have you seen that at all in your local Indigenous community? Yeah, it very much is so. And, um, you know, people have also... Some of the people there have talked about earlier fires from like 40, 50 years ago. So they've already lived through this once. And it just re-traumatises people. So it's not just a fresh trauma, it's the old traumas that come up as well. So it's really hard. And a lot of our community are quite poor, um, as is you know, across the whole country. Um, Many of the people, so some of us did lose their house within the Aboriginal community. Many of them didn't lose their house and they're in private rental um, or public housing. Um, the smoke caused quite a lot of damage um, and so, and also having refrigerators turned off for a couple of weeks, it really, it wasn't, you couldn't really. Yeah, you know, it wasn't a simple thing of cleaning the fridge and reusing it. They had to be chucked around. But because their house did not burn down, people were dismissing them. Um, not not other people in the community, but in the wider community and society. Well, like, well, the house didn't burn down. They're jumping on the bandwagon to get something for nothing. This is why people whose houses burnt down aren't able to access because you've got to check the fraud. But you know, mattresses and fridge, and when you're just on Centrelink payments, but, you know, it's not enough to live on Centrelink payments. And those people were being made to feel like that they were criminals or bludgers, at the very least, because they were asking for assistance to replace that stuff. Yeah. In terms of the longer-term effects, 
What, what do you think the long-term effect will be for you and your family, for your community? Um, I, I think this is going to take a long time to get over. Um, it may even create some frictions within the community um, about the best ways to move forward, about what people have lost, who's lost more, um, how we move forward. Um, you know, and it was interesting sitting at the meeting of the commission a couple of months ago in town when people were saying, and I've heard other um, people in the local community say, if we were just allowed to graze our cattle in the national park, this would never happen. Whereas somebody like me has thought, oh, no, no. Yes, we needed to look after the national parks better. We needed to look after the forests better. We need to look after our environment better. But increasing where the cattle can eat is not the answer. Um, you know, we have to actually manage our environment better. And so I think that as we start having these conversations about how we do that, I think in some ways it's going to cause some friction um, between certain areas within the community. It, I think at the moment people are more together as much as they can be, you know, given this virus isolating people, but there's a common sort of, we've got to heal, we've got to move forward, we've got to keep business in town, even though for me it's like, we've got to keep business in town, but I've got to limit the amount of resources to buy what we need to rebuild and town naturally is dearer, not the yep. fault of the business owners, but the expenses that they have. Um, do I spend my money in town or do I spend my money outside of town? You know, that sort of creates friction too, not just for me, but, you know, well, if we all start running out of town, those businesses cease to operate. So we're sort of in that real push-pull sort of relationship with each other. So it is quite fragile, those relationships. Um, there are some people who aren't rebuilding, who are leaving altogether, so we will lose part of our community as well. I think, you know, in the future, um, things will heal. But I think over the next couple of years, it's going to be quite a fragile place emotionally and for relationships between people and who did what you know who stayed who didn't stay um yeah i think we're going to have to live through all of that stuff until we can come out the other side of it i think once we come out the other side there will be relationships that are broken that won't be able to be repaired but i think as a whole and as a community will come out stronger yeah do you have any sense of whether there's ongoing support for the community in the longer term? Um, no, I think it will go away. Yeah. I think that support will just dwindle away. And, yeah, I think this virus has lessened what is there, but I don't think it'll ramp back up afterwards, unfortunately. I think people... Um, the community will have to find a way of working together to move forward. Yeah. Is there anything else, we've covered many things, but is there anything else that you'd like the commissioners to know about what you think should be done better before fires, during fires, after fires, any of those periods? Well, I, as I've already mentioned, I think the process for giving aid to people needs to be coordinated um, and that people shouldn't have to jump through hoops at this time. But um, on a bigger scale is I do think we have to start taking seriously the climate change. And I know that's a dirty word for people. I know politically it's most probably the worst thing to bring up. Um, but realistically, we know climate change is real. All the scientific evidence is there. Climate change is a real problem. And if we don't change the way we live, it's just going to get worse. We're, we're at that point of almost being at no return. And I think this virus has also you know, shown... Um, the, the virus is also um, caused by the way we live, the way we consume, the way we treat 
every other living thing on this planet. And if we don't pull ourselves up here and now, things are only going to get worse. So yes, short term, we can't change the impact that we're currently having. These fires are going to happen. We need to prepare communities to not just say to the individual, that's your bit of land there, that's your responsibility, but we need to, as a whole of society, actually say, well, what happens to you also happens to me. The impact is real for all of us. Let's look after what we've got. Let's help each other to look after that little bit that each other has. But then thinking about the bigger picture, we do have to change the way we operate and the way we live. What the way we currently, this capitalist society doesn't work. It doesn't just not work for humans that are at the bottom of our pile, but it doesn't work for the environment either. And I'm someone who's worked my way up from being at the bottom of the pile, and now, you know, it didn't save me from this. So working your way economically and being economically stable isn't the answer there's got to be something else um, and our communities the indigenous communities around the world have always known what that is very simple things that we can start doing is thinking about the way we contain the undergrowth we need to bring in indigenous fire management that's one very simple step at the very beginning but we also need to think about the rest of the way we operate as a society um, i think the positive side to the virus is it's shown us how quickly society operates when we reduce the amount of cards on the road when we start doing other things so we need to change the way we live now I, i'm not a fool in thinking that people will go with that very quickly or that it is something we can do very quickly but the small steps that we can start with and in Wiradjuri we have this word, this phrase, yinnamara, which at its simplest forms means respect and honour, but it also means how we should live, which is to go, slowly, go gently and go slowly. And if we were to think about that as our way of living, think about the impact that we have on all else, then we can start really moving forward. And it's not just about us who are here now, it's about the generations to come after us. And I can't just think about myself, I've got to think about my grandchildren's grandchildren and what we're leaving them as well, um, if we don't blow it all up beforehand. And I think this year has really told us that we need to get our act together and to be serious about this. And yes, it will hurt, but I don't know that it will hurt any more than where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. So. Where do you see yourself you, you, in the future, going forward two years, five years from now? What, what's the long-term effect? Like, where do you, you say you're rebuilding your house? Yeah. Where do you think you'll be five years from now? Um, hopefully the house will be well and truly really <laughs> finished um, in five years. Um, I had thought that I'd be retired, but now I think I will still be working to pay off the rebuild. Um, I think I will have changed a lot of stuff. Um, you know, having had nothing as a kid, I've always, um, you know, not wanted to buy secondhand clothes because, you know, always wore secondhand clothes. Um, having new sheets, having new bed, and now just going, no, hang on. No, that, that's the problem. That's part of the problem. So I think even though I'll still be working um, and working at universities despite people thinking that academics and school teachers have lots of holidays, they don't, I think I'll still be working. But I think so many other ways I will slow down and, you know, put this lesson to good use. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for helping us. Thank you. <laughs>
The Royal Commission has adjourned and will resume at 10am tomorrow.